How are you doing today? Great to be with you. We're approaching the July 4th holiday. Tomorrow is the 4th of July. And today uh, is July 3rd. And many people actually have this day off work. It counts as their, as their July 4th. And since that is the case, I was planning to do something a little bit different. Usually with these lives, I do kind of a news roundup. But in the spirit of the holiday, I will, of course, be answering your super chats. Any super chats you got, I will give you an answer. But, but before we, you know, before we, we after we have a few announcements and such, um, banter, I was going to give you kind of an introduction, uh, you know, an overview of U.S. politics and political culture since World War II and show you how politics has built on itself since the Second World War. Because if you look at U.S. politics, in a lot of ways, everything that is happening now is the result of a number of trends that have been culminating since the Second World War. And I constantly get asked by people that are advocates of socialism, what do we do? What do we do now? How do we, what do we do? How do we get from here to socialism? Well, in order to do that, you need to understand how we got where we are. And so I'm looking forward to having that conversation with you all and answering your super chats and doing our roll call. So I'm going to do my opening presentation um, and kind of give you an overview of how U.S. political culture, U.S. politics and U.S. culture in general has been building on itself, the contradictory trends, et cetera, since World War II. And then we'll do our roll call, and then I'll answer your super chats. And, uh, yeah, we'll see how we're doing. Before I get going, I want to shout out to my good friend, Ramiro Funes. I just got my copy of the Green Book. I wrote an introduction to Gaddafi's Green Book, published this new edition. And it was my good friend, Ramiro Funes, uh, who did the layout work. And he did a spectacular job. Uh, this is great. Uh, the Green Book... Uh, you know, nice matte cover, uh, very well laid out uh, text. Um, you know, we got a big picture of Gaddafi uh, in there, uh, the author. Um, we've got, you know, of course, introduction by Caleb Maupin, my lengthy introduction explaining the Green Book and, and the war in Libya and all of that. Um, you know, he included some actually some very good artwork, some of the original artwork, you know, this, this diagram of how the Libyan government and parliament works. Ramiro did a really, really good job with the layout. Uh, this is the first Center for Political Innovation book, uh, the first book the CPI has published. So I feel really good about it. If you want a copy, just get on Amazon right now, seven bucks, not much, uh, and it's definitely worth it. It's a, it's a high quality, high quality piece of work. So I want to thank Ramiro for the beautiful job he did laying this out and encourage people to get a copy. And, um, like I said, I won't be doing a news roundup, but I will answer any super chats that people have, but I will answer them after I finish my introduction. I do have plenty of orange juice. It's a lovely day. I'm in my lovely Brooklyn apartment. It's not quite sundown here in New York yet. Um, so yeah, why don't we jump into it? Folks, to understand politically where we're at in the United States right now, you have to understand a trajectory. And I'm going to basically spell it out for you very quickly and then go into detail about it. First, you have to understand McCarthyism. You have to understand McCarthyism. McCarthyism. Then, you have to be able to understand how McCarthyism led to hippies. I should say slash new left. And then you have to be able to understand how hippies and the new left led to the religious right. And then you have to be able to understand how the religious right led to new atheism. And SJWism. And then you have to be able to understand how New Atheism, SJWism led to Trump. 
And then, based on that understanding, you can understand where we go from here. Big question mark. So let's get right into it. McCarthyism. What was McCarthyism? Well, McCarthyism. All right, writing it down. Popular conferences in the USA. Okay, McCarthyism was following the Second World War, a wave of anti-communist hysteria in the United States. Um, you know, the United States had been victorious in the Second World War. The Soviet Union had been aligned with the United States during the Second World War. But almost as soon as the war ended, there was a wave of anti-communism all throughout U.S. society, and it was called McCarthyism. And many people just know that McCarthyism was this anti-communist hysteria in the United States, COVID denialism, okay, writing it down, it was this wave of anti-communism in the United States, uh, open borders, okay. All right. But there was a lot going on with McCarthyism. McCarthyism wasn't one single thing. It was a lot of things. So before the Second World War, we had a very... Is dealing with the likes of Vosh and Co. worth it? Okay. Okay. So McCarthyism was based on the fact that prior to the Second World War in the United States, we had a very progressive government, right? The, the Roosevelt administration, starting really in Roosevelt's second term, starting from like 1936 up until the death of Roosevelt, we had probably the most left-wing pro-socialist, not socialist, but, but in favor of cooperating with socialist and communist government that we've ever had in the United States. You know, Roosevelt, uh, you know, basically, Roosevelt was a Democrat, um, and he was aligned with the Rockefeller family. Uh, he was, had been governor of New York. He became president of the United States. The Rockefeller oil family were his biggest allies, and he faced the threat of a military coup. In 1934, there was a military coup, an attempted military coup against him uh, called the Business Plot. It was revealed by, by U.S. military leader Smedley Butler, who testified before Congress about how a number of business leaders had approached him about you know, staging a march on Washington to violently overthrow the government and set up a fascist military dictatorship. So in, in the face of the threat of a fascist coup, and in the face of an economic crisis called the Great Depression, Roosevelt started aligning himself with communists and with socialists. Um, he supported the labor union movement, he, he said that he supported the right of workers to occupy their factories during sit-down strikes. Um, and he, he took some unprecedented moves. I mean, he hired, he spent government money to hire the unemployed. He hired unemployed people and put them to work building infrastructure around the United States. Uh, he legalized labor unions with the Wagner Act. Uh, he created a national labor relations board that would basically oversee the ability of workers to unionize on the job. Um, he took some really unprecedented measures. He created unemployment insurance, um, and he did some really, really dramatic things. And in order to do it, he had an alliance with the Communist Party, with the unemployment councils, with the CIO, the Congress for Industrial Organizations, which was a new labor union movement that was organizing steel workers and auto workers and other workers that the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, wouldn't touch. They considered them unskilled. And Roosevelt, at some points was very blatant about how much he admired the Soviet Union and how much he thought the Communist Party was, was okay. For example, uh, Congress investigated Roosevelt uh, for his ties to the Communist Party, and so he let Gilbert Green, who was a member of the Young Communist League, sleep over at the White House. Um, and it, what was interesting is that Eleanor Roosevelt, Roosevelt's wife, she was pro uh, or anti-Jim Crow. Uh, and she made a point of, of speaking against Jim Crow segregation, speaking in favor of civil rights. Now, Roosevelt wasn't willing to go that far. It was kind of a strategic decision. But, but you know, the beginnings of, of speaking against Jim Crow segregation were happening. 
And Roosevelt was very open that he thought the Soviet Union were good allies against the Nazis. Um, you know, communists and socialists and labor leaders were invited to the White House. It was a left-wing left -wing government. And it, it took all these dramatic moves to improve the lives of working people during the Great Depression. When the Second World War began, the U.S. Um, Red Brown, okay, yeah. When the Second World War began, at that point, the United States was aligned with the Soviet Union against Nazi Germany, and Roosevelt had a huge cult of personality. I know, for me, like, both of my grandparents were lifelong, both both sides, you know, my, my grandparents on my father's side, my grandparents on my mother's side, both of them were lifelong Republicans, but they spoke about Roosevelt like you were talking about Jesus. You know, he wasn't a Democrat, he wasn't a Republican, he was just this amazing man who saved our country during uh, during the Depression and World War II. Roosevelt was just held by, in reverent awe. Working people thought Roosevelt was just a saint. Roosevelt could do no wrong. He was, he, so many working people had had their lives saved by Roosevelt. I mean, they, you know, I mean, listen to, uh, there's a song by Woody Guthrie, Dear Mrs. Roosevelt, which is, talks about how much Roosevelt was loved. Uh, there's a story of a textile worker shaking hands with Roosevelt and saying, I'm voting for you because you're the first man to know that my boss is a son of a bitch. You know, I mean, it was that kind of admiration. Roosevelt was just seen as a champion of working people. And it was no secret that the Communist Party USA supported him, campaigned for him. So coming out of the Second World War, um, you know, the USA and the Soviet Union were no longer allies. Right. The Cold War began. Roosevelt died. Roosevelt was replaced by Harry Truman. And within the Democratic Party, the biggest enemies of Roosevelt had been Catholics. It's very interesting. Right. And in. in Urban areas in the United States, New York City, Chicago, Philadelphia, uh, Pittsburgh, Minneapolis, you have a lot of Roman Catholics, right? Uh, you have a lot of Irish folks, Italian folks, Eastern European folks that are Roman Catholic. And the Catholic Church was very opposed to Roosevelt. In fact, the leader of the Democratic Party of New York City was a guy named Al Smith. And Al Smith was a Democrat, and he was an Irish Catholic, and he formed something called the American Liberty League, which was a group of Democrats who thought Roosevelt was a secret communist, and they worked against him. And, and within the Democratic Party, the Catholic, the Catholic associations, Italians, Irish, Roman Catholic folks, they hated Roosevelt because they thought he was sympathetic to communism. Uh, they were very, very hostile to Franklin Roosevelt. They considered him to be just rotten. Um, and so... After Roosevelt's death, the Catholic wing of the urban political machines, um, they began to move against the Roosevelt wing of the urban political machines. The Democratic Party tends to be based, it, at that point it was the South was the Democratic Party, and it was the, the urban areas of the North. And in the urban areas, the Catholic wing of the Democratic Party just went after the pro-Roosevelt wing of the Democratic Party and accused them of having ties to communism, of being foreign agents. And it was actually the Kennedy family, you know, John F. Kennedy's father, uh, you know, was part of the, the House on american Activities Committee. And they just started viciously going after the pro-Roosevelt wing of the Democratic Party. And that started happening. It started with the Catholic Democrats saying that, you know, there is this pro-communist wing of the Democratic Party that Roosevelt gave half of Europe to Stalin. Um, eventually, you know, the Roosevelt had somehow enabled China to have a communist revolution. Roosevelt was a traitor. Roosevelt was a Soviet agent. And it started with that, um, and the Communist Party was outlawed in uh, 1948. They had a federal trial called the Smith Act trial where the leaders of the Communist Party were put in jail. Um, you know, and television was a new thing. For the first time, American families had TV, and every night on television, they were telling people the Soviets are going to drop atomic bombs on us and kill us all. And Americans were just whipped up into this hysteria. The Communists are coming. The Communists are going to kill us. And it was, it was a scary moment. And it started with the Democratic Party, but then it turned into the Republicans accusing the Democratic Party, the entire Democratic Party, of being soft on communism. And what was weird was it started to take on McCarthyism was a lot more than just an anti-communist uh, hysteria. For example, um, uh, you know, one of the big things during the, the, the period was that they, they really started to crack down on homosexuality in the United States, which was weird because the Communist Party didn't allow any gay people to join at that point. The Communist Party said that homosexuality was bourgeois decadence, um, and they had a ban on any gay members. That didn't matter. So there was this feeling in U.S. media that homosexuality was somehow communist. If someone was gay, they were probably a communist. 
So the State Department actually had a ban on any gay person working in the State Department, and most and a lot of U.S. states had similar laws that if you were gay, you couldn't work you, you couldn't work in the government uh, because that meant that you might be a communist. Uh, there was a big crackdown on pornography, a big crackdown on uh, sexually explicit material, a lot of censorship. Um, and it was just kind of this, this shift in U.S. society where the society became very, very conservative and very, very militarized. The military became a very big part uh, of U.S. society. Um, and the Korean War happened, right? And there was a draft and thousands of Americans went and died in the Korean Peninsula. Um, and there was just a, a big crackdown. And, and McCarthyism, you know, it effectively weakened and isolated the Communist Party USA. Uh, it destroyed the Roosevelt wing of the Democratic Party. But it started to get out of control. You know, the ruling class of the United States started to feel like McCarthyism was getting out of control, um, especially after Stalin died. In 1953, Stalin dies, right? And Stalin dies, and the USA is getting the idea that Khrushchev, who comes to replace Stalin, is going to be somebody they can negotiate with. But they've whipped up this hysteria in society where they can't do that because the population is convinced that talking to a communist is evil. For example, Yugoslavia, 1948, Yugoslavia broke ties with the Soviet Union and, and started supporting the United States. So the U.S. government wants to, you know, play up this relationship with Yugoslavia. But all kinds of, uh, kinds of Americans are, are thinking, oh my God, you know, we can't support a communist country like Yugoslavia. I mean, there's actually a joke, you know, and McCarthyism is named after Senator Joe McCarthy, who was an Irish Catholic from Wisconsin, who was kind of the face of this. I mean, the, the, the leader of the House on American Activities Committee, um, you know, a, a U.S. senator. And, um, you know, there's a joke that, um, you know, someone comes before Joe McCarthy and Joe McCarthy says to them, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? And, Joe, and the person says, I'm very anti-communist. And he says, I didn't ask you what kind of communist you are. I asked, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? And it got so ridiculous. It got ridiculous, right? Uh, the Catholic Worker Organization, you know, it, it was, con you know, it was like basically outlawed because their newspaper had the name Worker in it. And people thought it was communist because that Daily Worker, right? Hollywood, right? They blacklisted and imprisoned a number of the Hollywood 10. There were 10 screenwriters who went to prison because they refused to testify against other screenwriters who were part of the Communist Party. All kinds of people lost their jobs. It was, it was insane. Like, it, public libraries wouldn't have communist books in them. Um, you know, there were states where, I mean, they, they, the Social Security Administration actually tried to outlaw communists receiving Social Security benefits. It was, like, insane. The anti-communist hysteria among the population got very insane. Stalin died. So Stalin died. And when Stalin died, there was a feeling that the United States, number one, could, could negotiate with Khrushchev. He was a little more open to negotiations with the United States. Number two, there was a feeling that Yugoslavia and China could be used as allies against the Soviet Union. So there was a feeling that this anti-communist hysteria wasn't helping the country. But that didn't matter. That did not matter. Um, you know, this, this section of the population was pretty riled up. And that a lot of these fanatical anti-communists were taking the anti-communism to this really extreme direction. For example, uh, the U.S. military was accused by Joe McCarthy of being, you know, controlled by communists. He claimed that somehow the communists had infiltrated the army and controlled the army. That's ridiculous. Um, you know, Joe McCarthy, um, Joe McCarthy, I mean... He made all kinds of extreme allegations. A lot of the literature that was put out by supporters of Joe McCarthy said that the Rockefeller family were communists because they'd supported Roosevelt. Said that the, the, the Methodist Church, for example, the Methodist Church, one of the biggest you know, Protestant denominations in the United States because it had signed statements about social justice, it was being accused of being communist. And, and it was so extreme and crazy that sections of the U.S. government felt like it was hurting U.S. foreign policy. And on top of that, um, many young people were alienated from McCarthyism. There was a feeling that McCarthyism was so extreme um, that it made the communists seem attractive almost. And there were a lot of young people who wouldn't have been communists, but then McCarthyism came along and they got interested in communism. Another thing that happened, um, you know, was that racism was a big issue, right? I mean, I mean, the United States had Jim Crow segregation at that point. 
And the McCarthy crowd would say that anyone who protested for civil rights was a secret communist, was a communist agent. And it was, a, it was an ongoing problem. And so after the death of Stalin, you know, as Khrushchev came in, there started to be a feeling among the U.S. ruling class that McCarthyism was out of control. And there started to be a feeling that, that in order to effectively fight the Soviet Union, they needed to counter McCarthyism. That was basically what was going on. There was a shift in the strategy of how to defeat the communists. And the U.S. ruling class was shifting toward, you know, supporting Yugoslavia, toward the CIA had already been covertly funding Trotskyites and, and left-wing intellectuals that were anti-communist. There was a feeling that, that it was better to fight the Soviet Union with a more liberal image than to be hardline militarists and all of that. And so there was a sh started to be a shift in U.S. society. And the weird thing was the population had been trained to be anti-communist and extremely right-wing. And that was, that was the thing. The, the population had been trained to think that pornography was communist, being gay was communist, uh, that, uh, that, that you know, any communist country was pure evil, we couldn't align with them or have relations with them in the Cold War. You know, the, the population had been so brainwashed by television that there was a big problem. I don't want the DPRK to have better relations with the USA or South Korea because it's trying to reimpose capitalism. Um, okay. Writing it down. And that was the feeling. So, things started to shift. And already, already, the U.S. government had been covertly supporting Trotskyists. It had been, you know, funding this magazine called Partisan Review. A lot of Trotskyists like Mary McCarthy, uh, you know, the sh followers of Max Schachtman, uh, they had been getting funded. Um, they had been getting funded by the U.S. government covertly. But starting around the time of the death of Stalin, there started to be a leftward shift among the ruling class of the United States, that, that this extreme McCarthyism had been hurting the image of the United States, that it was hurting U.S. foreign policy. The U.S.A. couldn't fight the Soviet Union effectively because it had, had, had gotten the population so brainwashed and crazy against communism. So that started to lay the basis for the, what you can call the new left, right? And the new left was very much a section of the U.S., ruling class trying to shift away from McCarthyism. Now, McCarthyism had been very, very socially conservative. Well, you had the research of Kinsey, Albert Kinsey, right? The Kinsey Report, which was this, this document that argued that sexual, uh, that sexual behavior, uh, you know, that was considered immoral or abnormal was much more common, uh, that it was more normal to be gay, it was more normal to masturbate, things like that. That was published. Um, birth control started to be more legal, legal, legal and accessible. Um, you also had, for example, um, you know, you had, uh, you know, the setting up of something called the Institute for Policy Studies, which was kind of a more critical anti-war think tank. Um, and you had, you know, some covert U.S. government and Rockefeller foundations and Ford Foundation money going to support different wings of the political establishment that were more left wing as a way to try and push back against the extreme anti-communism. Um, and that was the very beginnings of what you could call the new left. It was a shift. And part of the reason it was happening was because after the U.S. public started to get so sick of McCarthyism, a lot of the younger generation were actually joining the Communist Party. Membership in the Communist Party USA actually started to increase in the late 50s. Little known fact. And the Socialist Workers Party, the Trotskyite Party, their membership started to increase. And then among younger people, if they didn't fit in with the establishment, there was a feeling, oh, we should be communists because the, the government's constantly telling us communists are evil, communists are bad, and the civil rights movement was going. And a lot of these younger people liked the civil rights movement, and the government had been saying the civil rights movement was communist. So if you got involved with the civil rights movement, it seemed sensible that you would become a communist. So in order to try and divert younger people that were becoming you know, critical of the U.S. establishment from becoming communists, and in order to push back against the extreme anti-communism of McCarthyism, we had the new left, and that was the very beginnings of the new left. Um, you know, the United Auto Workers, which was, it's a major labor union in the United States, still is, but at that point it was huge because, you know, the auto manufacturing at that point was massive. Uh, the UAW was a union that had been built by communists, but during McCarthyism they had banned communists from joining. But it was headed by Victor Ruther and Walter Ruther, two brothers. They had both been, you know, Socialist Party members. 
And they even set up a student activist group called Students for a Democratic Society, SDS. Uh, it was originally called Students for Industrial Democracy. They changed the name to Students for a Democratic Society. And it was this activist group uh, that was set up, and it was funded by the UAW Union that would be pro-civil war, and, or I'm sorry, pro, uh, pro-civil pro rights and opposing the Vietnam War, right? And they were against the Vietnam War. They were in favor of the civil rights movement. They had a, a, a rule that no communist could ever join them, but they advocated what they called industrial democracy, which meant like worker co-ops and factories and stuff like that. They were liberals, kind of. And so Students for a Democratic Society started to organize around the country. Um, and, you know, in, in places like Berkeley, California, for example, University of California, Berkeley had a rule on the campus that no, no uh, political organizing could take place about off-campus issues, right? That if you were protesting about an off-campus issue, you weren't allowed to do that on the campus, right? So at Berkeley, 1963, some students were, you know, some students had a, a leaf, a literature table about civil rights. And of course, you know, the campus police showed up and said, you can't have this literature table here because it's about an off-campus issue. So they tried to arrest the students. The students refused to take their table down. They tried to arrest them. So a crowd of thousands of students came and surrounded the police car, wouldn't let the police car leave. They set up a microphone on the top of the police car and, and basically seized this police car for like a day um, and wouldn't let the police car leave. It was a big incident um, and it sparked what they called the free speech movement. And Students for a Democratic Society was on the campuses. Uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was a civil rights group that was, was also around, they were doing stuff. And on the campuses, you had a lot of young people that were becoming involved in the civil rights movement and opposing the Vietnam War. And you have to remember that part of the reason the civil rights movement was going was because the United States realized that, that on the issue of race, the Soviet Union was demonizing them. The Soviet Union you know, would, would, you know, for example, 1954, Emmett Till, a young African-American man, was, was murdered, lynched, for whistling at a white woman. Uh, you know, he, he allegedly whistled at a white woman, and he was murdered and beaten to death. And so, you know, they, they took a picture of his mutilated body. Uh, and this, you know, this 14-year-old young man was killed brutally. It's an awful picture. I, I mean, you know, look it up if you want. And so the Soviet Union took that picture and sent it all over the world. They said, the USA says it believes in democracy and freedom. Take a look at this picture of what they do to black people. Um, and in Africa, you know, the United States was constantly trying to convince people in Africa to be anti, uh, anti-communist. But it was very, very hard to get African leaders to trust the United States when they would see that picture of Emmett Till's mutilated body. And you had the rise of anti-imperialist fighters in Africa like uh, like uh, Kwame Nkrumah and like Patrice Lumumba and all over Africa. You had a lot of black black people that were rising up and fighting American imperialism and they hated the United States because of what it was doing to black people at home. And so, you know, this this all caused the U.S. ruling class to start the seeds, planting the seeds of the new left. And the, the premise of the new left was that communism was pure evil, you know, but we're going to we're going to be better than the communists. And they, they talk about anti-totalitarianism. Hannah Arendt was a big thinker uh, who had been covertly funded by the CIA. She had this whole concept of totalitarianism. She said that the Nazis and the Soviets were the same. That sounds a little familiar now, doesn't it? Um, and, and this was the beginnings of, you know, covert U.S. government support for something called the New Left. And the New Left was very much a cultural movement, right? Um, you know, the New Left was, was very much, you know, starting to talk about homosexuality, for example. Allen Ginsberg was a poet uh, who lived in San Francisco, um, and he published uh, a poem that had a lot of references to gay sex in it. It was called Howl, uh, and he was arrested for doing so, and, you know, he, it was like, he was like put on trial, and he was given a lot of support, and the U.S. media gave him a lot of attention. He became kind of a celebrity because of this. Right now, later, Allen Ginsberg became revealed to be a pedophile. Many people don't talk about that, but he wasn't just gay. He was a pedophile. He was a gay pedophile. Um, but regardless, you know, um, you know, you had this kind of pushback against McCarthyism. But what started to happen was it started to get out of control because the Vietnam War was continuing. And even though the Civil Rights Act was passed, the African-American community was very, very unhappy. The things that, that the African American community was suffering from, you know, like Jim Crow, like like racism, like unemployment, just because you legally got rid of Jim Crow didn't make the problems go away. And they there continued to be urban rebellions. 1966 in Watts, Los Angeles, uh, there was uh, there was a huge uprising among the African American community. Um, you know, Detroit, 1967, a huge uprising among the African American community. 
Um, so all over, all over the country, African Americans are taken to the streets, and eventually the Black Panthers are formed. And the Black Panthers are a Marxist-Leninist group, like they're like a communist group of Black Americans. Um, Students for a Democratic Society is this organization that's been set up by the Democrats, the United Auto Workers, to kind of be their activist group. Well, it lifted the ban on communists, and Maoists, Maoist communists, took it over. Uh, there was the weather, Weatherman faction, Revolutionary Youth Movement. There was the Progressive Labor Movement, which was another Maoist group. And the, the, the two groups basically controlled students for a democratic society. Uh, this, you know, the, the protests against the Vietnam War got to be very, very big. Um, at Columbia University, the students seized multiple buildings, took buildings, unfurled the Viet Cong flag from the building, you know, refused, and, and the police were sent in, and students fought the police and seized buildings. Um, you know, that was in 1968. Um, you know, you had at the Democratic National Convention in 1968, thousands and thousands of young people outside protesting, um, you know, and fighting with the police and burning the American flag because the Democrats were nominating uh, a pro-Vietnam War candidate, even though the majority of Democrats were against the war. Sound a little bit familiar. But anyway, you know, that, that all was happening. And so all these protests are happening at the Democratic National Convention and, and all over the country. You know, 1969, things escalate even further. 1968, you had Martin Luther King Jr. being assassinated. So then every major city in the country went up in flames with rebellion. And the new left was considered, it started out as the establishment trying to control, you know, and push back against McCarthyism. But it got beyond their control. It was originally set up as an anti-communist group, but pretty soon communist Lead, communist organizations became dominant. The Black Panthers, the various Maoist groups, uh, the new communist movement emerges out of the new left, which is attempts to build more like a new communist party, the Revolutionary Union, the October League. A lot of di different groups wanted to build something like the Communist Party USA of the 1930s. So there was a feeling that the new left got out of control. So there was a response to the new left, right? The new left was a response to McCarthyism. Well, the religious right, if you look at the roots of what we call the religious right, that was very much a response to the new left. Okay, so what was the religious right? I grew up around the religious right. I mean, probably no political movement in U.S. history has had a bigger impact on my political development than the religious right. So the religious right, yeah, it escalated in the 80s and 90s. That's when it had the most power. But it started in the late 60s. Right? They started to realize that, that, you know, it was a problem for the Republicans. Young people were not Republicans. Young people were not right-wing. Young people were not conservative. Young people didn't like the government. Young people didn't like, didn't like uh, the wars. They didn't like the military. Young people were growing their hair long and doing drugs. And the new left had all the power among young people. And the new, new left was considered, even by many of the people who started it, as out of control. Irving Howe, who was one of these CIA-funded Trotskyists, hated the new left, hated the, the new left, and would write articles for the New York Times as a Marxist opposing them. Um, and a lot of the, lot of the CIA-funded intellectuals turned against the movement that they essentially started because it started to be dominated by communists. So among the, among the ruling class, there started to be feeling a need that there needed to be an effort to stop the new left. The new left was out of control. Richard Nixon became the president. He came in, you know, on a platform that he was going to crush the new left. So they started experimenting with using the tactics of the new left for right-wing politics. And that was the beginning of the religious right. Um, you know, I think the first, the first, well, there was already among the new left, there was a grouping that you could call Jesus freaks. And you can Google this. Jesus people or Jesus freaks. That's what they called themselves. And they were hippie Christians. Um, and they were... They had long hair, they had beards, uh, they did drugs, uh, they, but, they, but they were into rock and roll, but they were Christians. And that, was, that happened, right? Because Christianity was kind of the official, you know, not technically, but almost the official religion of the United States. Many of the young people that got caught up in the new left were Christians. And they would call themselves Jesus freaks or Jesus people. And the Nixon administration and the CIA started trying to figure out how they could use the Jesus freaks and the Jesus people to push back against communism. Um, and there was an individual by the name of Tony Alamo, and he was a record, record company exec. He lived in Los Angeles, and uh, he actually was one of the major, uh, major you know, record company execs for the Beatles. His job was to market Beatles music around the United States. 
Um, and his story, I mean, who knows what happened, is that he had been in a, a record company meeting and he went outside to get a drink and God spoke to him and, you know, he was born again or whatever. Tony Alamo basically quit being a record company exec and started setting up a religious cult. Um, and it was, it was Jesus freak kind of stuff. They sang rock and roll music. They had long hair and beards. They didn't do drugs, but you know, if they looked like new leftists, right? And they would talk about Jesus, the revolutionary, etc. But if you got to know them, very anti-communist, very socially conservative, very pro-Republican, but they looked like new leftists and they sang songs on guitars and stuff like that. And after Tony Alamo got going, and he would recruit the same people the New Left would recruit. There were a lot of teenage runaways in the 1960s. Teenagers, they wouldn't get along with their parents or whatever. They would run away from home, move to L.A. because they wanted to be a movie star or whatever. Those are the kind of people that he would recruit to his group. right? So Re Reverend Tony Alamo has, has started basically this right-wing political group that's using New Left aesthetics. They look like hippies. They're actually right-wing conservatives. So then they... It gets even wilder. Then they recruited... Reverend Sun Young Moon, Reverend Sun Young Moon, right? He's this pastor from South Korea, right? Who has an anti-communist religious group in South Korea. And Reverend Sun Young Moon, his followers are imported to the United States. The Nixon administration reaches out to this Korean pastor and says, Reverend Sun Young Moon, can you please come to the United States? We need to fight the communists on college campuses. And the CIA started working with the Moonies, they were called, to build, you know, recruit and build an anti-communist organization on the college campuses of the United States. Um, and the Moonies, uh, again, much like the Tony Alamo group, they looked like hippies. They sang, they sold flowers, they sold candles, they, you know, they danced, they called themselves a peace movement, they lived in communes, right? But the more you got to know them, they were fanatical anti-communists. They supported the Vietnam War. Um, they were big supporters of Richard Nixon. In fact, when Nixon was being impeached, they started starving themselves because they were big supporters of Richard Nixon. They were a right-wing group, but they were using left-wing aesthetics. And that was understood that that was the weakness of the right wing in the United States, that the right wing was associated with mainstream Christianity, with Catholicism. And that that's the, the kids who grown up, grew up watching television, they just weren't into this, right? That they, they, they were into rock and roll music and Elvis and the Beatles and stuff. So it, the, the right wing kind of reinvented itself for baby boomers. And that was the beginnings of the religious right. Reverend Billy Graham, uh, you know, who was this well-known evangelical pastor, he started having rock and roll songs on his TV broadcasts. And suddenly there was this understanding that, that if the right-wing conservatives could emphasize religion and use the counterculture aesthetics, that they could build right-wing movements. And basically throughout the 1970s, gradually this tactic started working more and more and more, right? The Moonies and Tony Alamo started it, Billy Graham started doing it, but gradually it started to work more effectively. And by about the, the late 70s, 1978, 1979, you had the rise of Jerry Falwell. And Jerry Falwell was a, a right-wing minister, um, you know, who he built something called the Moral Majority. And you had kind of a mass religious movement in the United States that was pro-war, pro-Republican, conservative, right-wing, anti-communist fanatics, but they, they used kind of the hippie aesthetics, right? spiritual spiritualism heavy emotions uh a lot of crying a lot of singing you know it, it wasn't like old school christianity right they weren't they weren't getting into great depth about theology right they they would be like you know you'd ask and i, I grew up around these people you, you talk to them you know it's like you know they'd say well what do you think about um you know the concept of of communion is it really the body of christ or not and they would say i just believe the bible man i don't care i just believe the bible you know, you'd ask them, you know, uh, okay, well, what do you think about, uh, well, I mean, there's, you know, there's a very academic tradition that comes out of Christianity where the denominations have split over, they don't know anything. It's just this kind of rock and roll religious movement, right? You know, uh, people jokingly call it Christianity for dummies, right? It's just kind of like, we just believe the Bible, man. The Bible is the true word of God and, and America is the greatest country in the world. 
and and abortion is evil and homosexuality is evil and communists are evil. Um, and that was kind of it, it, the 80s is when it really got its strength. Um, you know, the, the early 80s, you started to see the, the strength of the religious right and the religious right, you have to remember, had been created to push back against the new left and the new left, you have to remember, had been created to push back against McCarthyism. So, you know, the religious right started to gain power. But what also happened in the 1980s is you started to see the U.S. society start to stabilize, right? The, the, the political upsurge of the late 60s, early 70s was kind of in the past. And Ronald Reagan very famously said in the 1960s, he said, we're all friends after six, saying that Democrats and Republicans were basically on the same team, right? You know, we, we get up and argue with each other in Congress, but we're all friends after six. We go to the same bars and drink. We take money from the same big corporations. We have the same foreign policy. We hate the same countries. And that was the case, right? That because U.S. society had significantly stabilized in the 1980s, the divisions in the U.S. ruling class were almost gone. Um, there had been a big rivalry in the 60s between the CIA and the Pentagon, but they were getting along, right? Brzezinski, the big CIA guy, Reagan gave him the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Um, and, you know, at that point, U.S. society, there was kind of peace within the ruling class. The socialist camp was getting weaker. And, you know, because of that, uh, you know, we started to see an end to, an end to the heavy divisions in the ruling class. The 1980s, you started to see a stabilization of U.S. society. And basically what happened was, uh, you know, the, the new normal of the late Cold War, post-1960s and 70s, was that basically the religious right were what you called, it was, it was almost like, I almost compare it, it's like the flip side, or it, it, it almost mirrors Iran in this weird way. In Iran, you know, the, the two political camps, they have the hardliners and the moderates. The hardliners call themselves principalists, the moderates call themselves reformists, but there are people who are vehemently, fanatically in favor of the Islamic Revolution, and there's people that are, you know, eh, they're kind of backing away, they're, they're a little less. And in the United States, the religious right were the hardliners. They believed in American capitalism and the military and, and imperialism. And then you had liberals, which were the moderates. And that was kind of the new normal of the late Cold War. Of the late Cold War, you had the religious right that were the hardliners of America, and then you had the liberals and the Democrats that eh, they basically believed the same thing, just not as fanatically. That was the new formulation. And after the fall of the Soviet Union, after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, you know, that political format remained intact, right? And the, the Republicans were the party of the religious right, and the neocons, right? The neocon foreign policy strategists. And the Democrats were a little less enthusiastic, but they all kind of had the same message, right? But let's speed up to the Bush administration, right? The Bush administration was probably the height of the strength of the religious right in the United States. Never before had the religious right been that powerful. George W. Bush was himself an adherent of the religious right. Uh, he didn't believe in evolution. Uh, he had been an alcoholic and becoming a, a Baptist fundamentalist had helped George W. Bush give up his drinking, in theory, or his cocaine or whatever. And so because of that, because of that, the religious right was really, really powerful, really, really powerful in the, um, in the, in the Bush years. And 9-11 happened during the Bush years. You remember 9-11? And the economy, let's remember that from about 1980 to the Bush years, there was just a gradual decline in the incomes of Americans, living standards of Americans, plus the demographics of the United States were gradually changing, right? I mean, the, you know, the United States was less and less of a quote-unquote white country, right? Uh, that there was a lot of immigration um, and that, that, that the demographics of the United States were changing. So gradually, right, culminating in the Bush years, right? Bush himself is an evangelical Christian, 9-11 happens. And a lot of the evangelicals, you know, are really tied in with Israel. They're very supportive of Israel. And so they declare that 9-11 is, you know, this is a war between Christianity and Islam. And George W. Bush even went as far as calling it a crusade. Uh, there's a clip where George W. Bush said, we're having a crusade. And of course, in the Muslim world, the term crusade, you know, doesn't go over too well. People remember all the massacres and killing. So, you know, the Bush administration you know, was very, very, I mean, the religious right had all this power and they, they were blatantly anti-Islamic, right? And let's keep in mind, the Saudis are very, very, very key allies of the United States in the Middle East. The Muslim Brotherhood has been a very key ally of the United States. Eritrea, you know, has, has been a very key ally of the United States. And because of that, because of that, there's big problems. Then you'll also remember Hurricane Katrina, 
in 2005, right? Hurricane Katrina, it hit New Orleans, and the black community was left to die. And, and, and it was, what was done to the black community of New Orleans was horrendous. People were left to die. People were left to suffer. It was awful. And there was just this implication that the government didn't care, right? You remember Kanye West said George Bush doesn't care about black people. Um, and there was this implication that the U.S. government had abandoned uh, the African-American community. Um, and there were, there were big, you know, ongoing issues with police brutality and such. So, you know, on top of that, the United States has pretty much alienated the entire Muslim world. And on top of that, the United States had alienated Europe. Europe did not approve of the U.S. invasion of Iraq. France, in particular, had had an alliance, you know, had had a lot of business deals with Saddam Hussein. And so there was, there was this just, there's this feeling that Europe and the United States were getting further apart. Um, furthermore, at the same time, uh, you know, there was a complete alienation. Many of the allies of the United States in the Muslim world wouldn't work with the United States. The Muslim Brotherhood had been big time allies of the United States. They heard George W. Bush talking about a crusade, right? They saw extreme anti-Islamic rhetoric coming out of, um, coming out of the U.S., uh, the U.S. society and the religious groups and extreme pro-Israel stuff. They wouldn't work with the United States. Um, and so the Muslim world is alienated from the United States. Plus, at home, huge racial problems and unrest. The, I mean, the black community felt like they had been completely abandoned. They felt like George W. Bush was a racist. They felt, I mean, so, and the U.S., keep in mind, U.S. society is gradually becoming less and less white. So people of color is a much bigger number in U.S. society. So starting around 2005, 2006, you have a pushback against the religious right. And again, right, we have the rise of what you can call the new atheist movement, number one, and and what, I guess, I, I hate to use this word because it's what, like, right-wing people, but, like, SJWism. And both of those movements, both of those, you know, those trends, I guess you could call it, were a pushback against the religious right. And the religious right was a pushback against the new left, and the new left was a pushback against McCarthyism. You getting this? There's a continuity to all of this. Right? I remember 2006, I'm in college, uh, I'm walking, you know, through my dorm room, and someone's turn got C-SPAN on. And I look over on C-SPAN, and there's this guy I've never heard of called Richard Dawkins. And Richard Dawkins is on there saying, God doesn't exist. He's an illusion. He's like the flying spaghetti monster. You know, and that the new atheist movement is everywhere. Sam Harris becomes popular. And all of a sudden, all of these blatantly anti-religious speakers are on TV, Right? Where did this happen, right? It used to be illegal in many parts of the United States to deny the existence of God. I bet you didn't know that. But a lot of cities had blasphemy laws that it was considered to be offensive to religious people to say that God doesn't exist. So if you walked around saying God doesn't exist, you could be arrested. That's like the 1920s, right? But all over U.S. media, figures who are blatantly saying God does not exist are all over the television, right? And they're saying we need reason, we need science. This is a pushback against the religious right. The religious right, they're arguing, has ruined U.S. relations with the Middle East. The religious right has alienated the USA with Europe. Uh, the religious right, there's all kinds of racial unrest. So you have the rise of the new atheist movement, number one, that is just basically picking apart the religious right. They say the Bible is absolutely true. They, of course, rip that to shreds and show that, you know, that, that there's a lot of problems with that. Uh, you know, I mean, they're arguing there's nothing wrong with being gay. There's nothing wrong with abortion, that, that this is brainwashing. I mean, it's this whole mobilization, a lot of big money behind it to push back against the religious right. Furthermore, you have the rise of SJWism. White privilege was a term that only like leftists use, only like communists, anarchists talked about white privilege. But all of a sudden, the term white privilege became very mainstream. In like little tiny colleges in the middle of Iowa, they're having classes about white privilege, right? Um, like police officers in their training are hearing about white privilege. And it's like all of a sudden there comes this awareness of white privilege. Um, and that's huge. That, that had not happened before. So there's this whole widespread conversation about white privilege, uh, about gender oppression, about, I mean, and what you can call SJWism sprung up around the same time. It had been around before, but it got really big around the same time that the New Atheist Movement got really big, and it was a pushback against the religious right. And of course, this all paved the way for the election of a man by the name of Barack Hussein Obama. Barack Obama became president of the United States. And 
you know, Barack Obama's presidency was seen as a repudiation of the religious right. Barack Obama, you know, he... You know, he was a Christian. He was a member of a Christian church, but he had been to a Muslim school. He had a, an Islamic name. Um, Barack Obama was trying to heal U.S. relations with the Muslim world. Uh, Barack Obama was, you know, was much more friendly to the gay community and such. And, and he was promoting science and talking about global warming. And there was a feeling, there was a feeling that, that you know, the United States was going to push back against this and that the racial unrest that was growing throughout the United States was going to be healed. Barack Obama was going to come into office and heal the racial unrest. Um, and the Obama, the Obama presidency was a shift. And it was a really a big appeal to heal U.S. relations with Europe. Let's remember, Bush and the religious right had ruined U.S. relations with Europe. Barack Obama went to Berlin, Germany, during his campaign and gave a big speech to Berliners. He's not even, he's running for president of the United States, but he takes a big trip to Germany to just, just tell Europe, look, I'm on, I'm going to heal relations with Europe. Right after Obama gets elected, he goes to Egypt and he gives a speech in Egypt apologizing for the crimes against the Muslim world, you know, trying to reset relations with the Arab and Muslims of the world. You know, that was the Obama presidency. Um, and, you know, of course, there's a rise in conversation about white privilege on the campuses. There's a, a pushback against the religious groups that have had so much power in the United States for a long time. But what happens? What happens? Well, first of all, the economic crisis that happens right before Obama, the big crash, right? The economic crash of 2008, 2009 happened, right? Right as Obama was coming into office. And that crash was a culmination of the fact that the income of Americans had been significantly declining. Americans just couldn't keep spending like they were before, right? And the, the culmination of it was Americans, you know, they, they were not buying homes, right? They couldn't afford to keep buying homes. So in order to keep Americans buying homes, uh, Alan Greenspan had legalized all kinds of mortgage lending practices that were wildly illegal before. And, and pretty soon the housing bubble burst and the, the, the U.S. economy crashed in 2008, 2009. I mean, a dramatic crash. So Barack Obama is the president during a big economic crash. Um, furthermore, you know, there's all this awareness now about racism, right? White privilege and police brutality are widely being discussed. So protests against police brutality are taking place. And the protests become even bigger because there was many people in the black community who had believed that Barack Obama, because he was himself dark-skinned, that he would address the issue, that the, the issue of police brutality would go away because Barack Obama, you know, was, was, was a person of color. He was a black man and he, he would address the issue. And we saw in Ferguson, Missouri, things didn't get better. And so there was a prolonged, prolonged uprising of protests every night, armed protests, you know, violence in the streets. Ferguson, Missouri, there was Baltimore, you know, the Baltimore uprising, chaos in the streets, right? And that, that the racial issues in the United States are not being addressed, right? Um, and that the establishment had been kind of encouraging people to be more aware around it. So it, it, it was, there was already all this awareness about racism, but Barack Obama was unable to resolve the problem, right? And that the fact that a black president was elected and things got worse in a lot of ways for the black community in terms of the police state, made many people go out and protest who wouldn't have protested before. So, so there was a feeling that the Obama presidency, you know, had overall uh, failed to do what it was supposed to do, plus the economic crisis had continued, right? You know, even though the Obama administration, they did a lot of bailouts and all of that, but ultimately things weren't getting better. The income of average Americans was decreasing. Plus, you know, whenever you have an upsurge of, of black protests in the United States, you have what they call white backlash, which is a lot of white people getting angry about it and feeling like this is somehow a personal attack against them. So the Obama administration was unable, unable to resolve racial issues in the United States as it had been intended to do. It was unable unable really to uh, to to solve the, the the crisis internationally it, it was able to kind of establish better relations with Europe but internationally Russia and China keep rising um, you know the USA violently overthrows the Libyan government but it fails in Syria and so the Obama administration is failing so you have the rise of the Trump movement and the Trump movement is kind of harnessing that white backlash that that resentment uh, that resentment against against Obama and that resentment the religious people feel against, you know, the, the, uh, the new, what do you call the new, uh, the, the new atheist movement. 
Also, what's interesting is you have the rise of the alt-right. And many people have talked about how there's a pipeline. There's, that, that, you know, the, the, a lot of these alt-right guys were from religious right families. And they became new atheists. And then being a new atheist led them to become libertarians, right? Because the new atheist pitches were just so much smarter than everybody else. That's the libertarian approach too, right? We read free markets. We understand economics. So, you know, you go from being a new atheist. You're from a religious right family. You're public, your family are Republicans. But you become a new atheist. You stop believing in the religious right. You're a new atheist. You're a Democrat. But you're into free markets, right? You don't believe in any of that socialism garbage. You're, you've, you've read books, right? You, you understand that capitalism is the only way. I mean, it's just, it's the height of arrogance. It's because there's a lack of socialist politics out there. But regardless, so, you know, but then, you know, third step is alt-right, right? That these libertarians, right? I mean, socialism can't possibly be the answer because, you know, everyone knows communism's evil. So uh, if there's inequality in the world, it must just mean that some races are superior to others, they would argue. Right. And so you have this pipeline. Many people have commented on it. The guys who are now followers of Richard Spencer and, and white supremacists, most of them were from religious right wing families, became new atheists, became libertarians. And then because of the race question and because libertarianism and free market capitalism, you know, you know, doesn't seem to address inequalities, they became race open racists. And of course, they're in the Trump camp that when they were first, when they were new atheists, they were voting for the Democrats. Then when they're libertarians, they're voting for the Democrats. Now they're racists. Right? Um, and that trajectory, so we have, you know, religious people blowing back against the new atheist movement. Uh, we have the failure of the Obama administration to resolve the uh, racial tensions in the United States. Plus, we have this pipeline where people that were new atheists are becoming racists. That all lays the basis for Trumpism, right? Make America great again. Weird quasi alliance between, you know, openly racist folks. Uh, plus you've got, you know, the religious right, plus you've got very vehemently anti-Islamic bigots, which that comes out of the New Atheist Movement as well. The New Atheist Movement really did, I mean, have the idea that Islam was like the most evil religion and stuff like that. That was a big part of the New Atheist Movement. So, in a way, the Trump movement is a culmination of the Obama administration, right? The Obama administration, you know, you know, Obama couldn't address these issues. He unleashed the new atheist movement, which eventually led to the libertarian and alt-right pipeline, um, unable to resolve the issue. So, so the Trump movement is an attempt to address the problems of the created by the Obama movement. The Obama movement was an attempt to address the problems of the religious right. The religious right was an attempt to address the problems of the new left. The new left was an attempt to address the problems of McCarthyism. So that's kind of where we are. That's Trumpism is kind of the main, the main movement in the United States right now, right? I mean, it's the main, it's, it's in power. It's in the White House. Um, but obviously there's millions of Americans who don't agree with it. So the question is, what will be the response to Trumpism? What will it be? I mean, the establishment has has is is trying to defeat Trumpism because they uh, many people within the establishment feel like Trump is hurting the U.S.'s image internationally. Uh, that that the, that Trump is mismanaging this pandemic. So there's there's already starting to be a response to Trumpism, right? But what is it, right? I mean, Bernie Sanders and democratic socialism, you know, and social, you know, really like welfareism, social democracy is rising. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement has gotten even stronger than it was during the Obama years. I mean, these protests are massive. So what's going to happen next? And how do those of us who are socialists fit into this, right? We saw how the socialists operated during the New Left period. We saw how the socialists operated, you know, during the, the Roosevelt years. So how do those of us who are actually Marxists, we're not, you know, New Left hippies. We're not, you know, quote unquote, Bernie Krat democratic socialists. We're like actually want the banks, factories, and industries to be organized to serve the people. We want a centrally planned economy. We're anti-imperialist to our core. We don't support color revolutions. We, we, you know, we support uh, you know, friendship with socialist governments around the world. How do we operate? McCarthyism's reaction to the rise of socialism. Right, we'll talk about that. Um, how do we operate within this response to Trumpism? That's a question, I, I don't know, right? And how do we operate within Trumpism itself? I mean, I, I'm asking the question. I don't have the answer, but that's that's the situation that we're in. Trumpism, which was a response to uh, to the failures of 
you know, the new left and, or the new atheists and the SJWs, which was a response to the failures of the religious right, which was a response to the, to the failures of the new left, which was a response to the failures of McCarthyism. Well, now we're seeing a ruling class pushback against Trump. And the question is, what is it going to be? Number one, is it going to be full-blown social democracy? It seems like they're fighting that as much as they can. They don't want Bernie Sanders types to be the main voice of opposition uh, to, to Trumpism. Number one, uh, but number two, what's it going to look like? And I'm asking you. I mean, that's that's a fair question, right? There are what are they going to do? What kind of mobilization will be the pushback and response to the failures for the ruling class of the Trump administration of the Trump movement? What will it be? That's where we're at. And so that was how I wanted to open my live by giving kind of a quick since World War II overview of the political evolution of the United States, the cultural. And, uh, and, and political movements that have kind of gotten us to where we are today. So that's, that's what I want you all to be thinking about. And um, I think that's a good way to open all of this. And I'm going to take another drink of my, of my orange juice. And on that note, names and locations, folks. Names and locations. I'll call you out as I see you. Names and locations. Names and locations. Let me call you out as I see you. Roll call time. Snens in Germany. Dante from Southern California. Michael from Phoenix. Joseph from Ireland. Tommy Farras in Sicily. Ali from Northern Ireland. JT24 in Mississippi. Ken from Connecticut. Queens, New York. Bennett. Tim in the UK. Austin, Texas. Los Angeles. Norway. Peep Diddy from USA. Siraj in Tajikistan. Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Jack Dundee, Australia, Fairhope, Alabama, Vallejo, California, Belize, David in Italy, New York, Brandon from San Diego, Paul Moran says you skipped me, Washington State, Las Vegas, Georgia, Clyde Bank, Scotland, Pyongyang, Joe Gale in Nassau County, Reno, Nevada. Do, do you think there will be another McCarthyism? Okay. New McCarthyism. Let me write it down. Um, all righty. Um, Georgia SSSR, Candace from Florida, Taiwan, Taiwan is with us. Gosh darn it, says Nathaniel P. Adams. Macedonia, Rio de Janeiro, Florida, Rusty in Culver City, California, Montevideo, Uruguay, Independence, Missouri, Rachel Martinez, Poland but working in France, Secret Bunker, says Glasno. Who else is with us today? Oman, Oman, Leipzig, East Germany, Pomona, California, Jacksonville, Florida, Buenos Aires. David Fox says completely stuffed and he's out in Australia. Trevor from Ireland. Who else is with us today? I don't want to miss anyone. Feel free to type your name again if I missed it. I don't want anyone to feel missed. The Netherlands, Joanne, Rocky in Boston, Bello in Brazil, Nepal, Nepal. People want me to come on, Paul wants me to come on his stream. I think I can do that. Post-apocalyptic rural Michigan, Gateshead, England, Christian, Indiana, Anthony Penza is in Cleveland, Utah, Brazil, Charles Petty is in Utah. Who else is with us tonight? Maryland, Flushing, Queens, New York, Portugal, Rafael Mello, Yao, says Paul, Paul Moran, Carlos in Miami. Who else is with us tonight? Who else is with us tonight? Jesse, Pennsylvania. West Virginia, Springfield, Missouri. Names and locations, folks. I'll call you out as I see you. Days from the Imperialist Void. Poetic. Well, folks, uh, Malone, Illinois, home of John Deere. Burkina Faso, great. George, Utah, Ron Wagoner. 
If you haven't done it already, now would be a great time to hit the like button. Now would be a good time to hit the subscribe button. Now would also be a great time. Paragas is in Los Angeles. Now would also be a great time to tweet this out. Now would be a great time. Uh, Attica, New York. Lisbon, Portugal. Now would be a great, great time. It would be a great, great time to tweet this out, to put this on your Facebook. Make this a bigger conversation. Bring your friends. Hit the like button. Hit the notifications bell. Jenny Lynn is in Cincinnati, Ohio. Welcome, welcome. Make this a bigger conversation. Bring people on board. The more people that are here, the more fun we are going to have. Um, and uh, be sure to tweet this out. Be sure to make this a bigger conversation. Be sure to hit the notifications bell so you find out when we have the next one. The audience has really been growing lately. A lot more people have been watching these lives and conversations, and I'm very happy about that. Couldn't be happier. Couldn't be happier that more people are joining this community. Mel Helen Wooley from Melbourne is with us. Shout out to you, Helen. Glad you're with us. Couldn't be happier that more people are joining the conversations. Our audience has more than doubled, well over doubled since in the last year. This is amazing. This is great stuff. Um... You know, I announced this live, you know, two hours ago, and there's already well over 200 people watching this. So that's really good. That's really great news. Um, so the more people, the merrier. Be sure to share this with all your friends. Um, and uh, if there are more Super Chats, I will happily address them. Uh, Flame of Liberation is in New York and watching. Glad to hear it. Um, but yeah, so on that note, on that note... I will jump right into these Super Chats. If you have more Super Chats, be feel free to send them, and I will answer them. I will answer them. I'm not sure I'm going to do as long as I usually do, um, but there you go. Um, but yeah, so popular conferences in the USA. I guess that was a question in response to the, the, the Green Book by Gaddafi and how Gaddafi talks about the basis of the socialist government of Libya were these things called the, uh, the, the popular committees that Gaddafi formed, uh, these popular committees uh, that were kind of the basis of the revolution. Well, what's interesting is every socialist country has had something like that, right? In what does Soviet mean, the Soviet Union? That was councils, right? It was during the 1905 uprising against the Tsar. In St. Petersburg, in Russia, they formed a Soviet, a council, that was like the new ruling thing, and it was overturned. Trotsky was the president of it. It was overturned, but then during the 1917 uprising in Russia, they formed all over the country, they formed Soviets, workers' councils. Um, you know, and in China, they had peasant associations, and they had workers' councils and factories. Um, you, know, uh, you know, in Cuba, they had these things called committees to defend the revolution. In Venezuela, they have what's called Bolivarian circles. Do you think Trey Gowdy has a chance as GOP 224 nom? Oh, Trey Gowdy. Is that true? Uh, yeah, Trey Gowdy. We'll talk about Trey Gowdy and Texas. Um, but yeah, um, you know, Charles gave me a thumbs up. I don't know if he liked my Trey Gowdy impression or what, but there you go. But yeah, every socialist country has had these kind of community assemblies. And that's why, you know, socialist countries can be bad on human rights. They can, they, they can have to have a clamp down on free speech and stuff that, 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 you know, because they're surrounded, because they're under attack, because they don't have democratic traditions, because they're facing an onslaught from imperialism. But in a way... All the socialist countries have been overwhelmingly more democratic than any of the Western capitalist countries for the simple reason that every socialist country requires bringing people into the political process. You cannot have a society where the banks, factories, and industries are organized to serve public good and not profits, where production is carried out to serve public good and not simply based on the chaos of the market, without a mass mobilization of the population, right? And that in order to bring about socialism, you have to bring people into the political process. You have to have neighborhood committees. You have to have, uh, you know, organizations and community groups where people are actively involved, giving their opinion, setting policy, and carrying out the goals of the revolution, right? There could be no Mao without local Communist Party cells in every neighborhood. There would not be, have been an Iranian revolution without what they call the Basij, and those were, that means mobilized oppressed. It was these community organizations. And every neighborhood in Iran, they have what's called the Basij Council. And it's a group of people, they're local people who believe in the Islamic Revolution. And they have educational classes about the Islamic Revolution and its principles. And they go around enforcing the Islamic Revolution. Um, 
you know, on a, uh, on, on a local level. And every socialist country, even the one like North Korea, right? North Korea is very militarized, under attack. But you can bet in North Korea, in every neighborhood, they have a, I don't even know what they call it there, but they have some kind of local committee in which people are getting together on a almost daily, maybe weekly basis. People in the community are speaking up and giving their opinion and carrying out the goals of the revolution on a local level. You don't get that in capitalism. In capitalism, you know, politics is something the ruling class takes care of and we're just kind of pushed outside. You cannot have a socialist society without some kind of popular committee, without some kind of workers' council, with some kind of community assembly. It's necessary in order to have socialism. So even socialist countries that are very authoritarian are more democratic in that sense. Democracy isn't just human rights. Democracy is the rule of the people, the involvement of the people in the political process. North Korea has a huge, no one can deny that the North Korean people, the average North Korean, is heavily involved in the political process. You may not like what they do. And you, can you discuss the history of Khatib and the Muslim Brotherhood? Absolutely. Um, you cannot deny, you absolutely, um, are there any MLs you'd like to debate? Um, okay. Um, you cannot deny that people are, are more politically active. Um, you cannot deny that people are brought into the political process. And that is a big part of democracy. Democracy doesn't, it's not just freedom. It's rule of the people. And socialist countries have a way bigger involvement of the population. Modern China, every neighborhood, every apartment building has a party committee, a communist party committee. It's in the apartment building and, and trying to run things in the apartment building and mobilize the people in the apartment building in line with the communist party's goals. Um, any socialist country has this. And that's what a lot of these people don't get. And when you have huge participation on the part of the population in managing the affairs of the state in, in the political process, that's democracy. So, you know, Cuba. Cuba is far more democratic than the United States in that sense, because in Cuba, average people are far more engaged and involved in the political process than here in the United States. That's just a reality, right? The average Cuban is more involved in pol political life, is part of a local community committed to defend the revolution, is trying and mobilizing their community members to carry out the Communist Party's goals. The average Cuban is more involved in politics than the average American. Now, it's different, right? And I'm, I'm not pretending that there's an ish, a different level of human rights, but I'm just telling you that democracy in the sense of the people ruling, in the sense of the people, people exercising political power, socialist countries are very much more democratic than Western capitalist countries are. That's just a reality. Might be surprising. It's hard to realize that. It doesn't make sense with what we know, the way we've been trained to think about democracy in the West. But democracy is the involvement of the people and the people carrying out the goals and the people being involved in setting policy, the people carrying out things, you know. Read, there's a section in the Little Red Book by Mao Zedong where he talks about the mass line, right? And from the masses to the masses. The Communist Party would hear what the masses said and give it to them. From the masses to the masses. So, yeah, um, and things like popular committees. And yes, as the American working class begins to to get into motion, things like the popular committees are going to come into existence. Workers' councils, people, community assemblies are going to be formed. No question about it. No question about it. The only way socialism would ever be able to come to the United States would be with a huge upsurge of democratic participation and activism, the population taking history into their own hands. Um, and that's going to happen. And that's when revolutions happen. It's when average people who never, what do you, what, what does everyone hate about Trotskyists? Okay. Um, that's really the essence. The essence of socialist revolutions is when average people who normally are not politically active feel they have no choice but to become politically active, right? Feel like they have to be involved. They have to get involved because the conditions mandate it. If they don't get involved in, in, in politics and the affairs of state and if they don't become politically active, there's going to be a big problem in society. Thank you, Larry Chino Chavista Chu. I appreciate it. Um, you know, that is, that is what's going to happen. So, um, I hope that answers your question. I mean, and it's already, I mean, we're already seeing it around the country, people getting active and stuff. We don't have formal bodies yet. And this is what they call dual power. You should read what Lenin wrote about the concept of dual power. When new institutions of popular power emerge within a society, dual power, 
Um, I don't know Thomas Sowell. I just don't know his stuff, so I can't comment on that, Charles. I'm sorry. Uh, but dual power, and it's an it's a essential part of any revolution. So check out dual power. Um, there you go. COVID denialism. Uh, I was basically asked, is that a sign of the education system? It's a sign not just of the education system, but of how much the American people have been betrayed by their government and lied to over and over and over again. It's like the little boy who cried wolf. The U.S. government said there was weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Lie. Uh, the U.S. government said that uh, Russia rigged our elections and got Trump elected. Lie. Uh, the U.S. government said, uh, how many things has the U.S. government said over the years that have turned out to be big fat lies? And when you lie to people over and over again, they stop believing you. The little boy who cried wolf. Classic children's story. I think every every person has been told, you know, about about that. That if if you you know, and then the, you know, the story is the little shepherd boy wants to get attention, so he runs to the village and says, "There's a wolf coming to attack my sheep." And the people run, and there is no wolf. And you know, he does it again. You know, oh, there's a wolf coming to attack my sheep. And 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 finally, when the wolf actually does come, uh, the little boy runs to the village and says, "Oh, the wolf is attacking my sheep," and people don't believe him. Right? Um, you know, they don't believe him. Why would they believe him, right? He lied so many times, and so the, the, his sheep are eaten by the wolf because, you know, uh, he, he, you know, do, you know and that's, that's the thing. That's the situation, right? That the U.S. government has lied so many times. And what's so sad is that there are these fake socialists all over the Internet who don't think the U.S. government lies. They don't. They, they think the U.S. government, no, nope, U.S. media said it, it must be true. Um, and they think that, but they're still somehow socialists. And, and of course, that discredits leftism, right? And again, why would you be a socialist if you thought that? If the U.S. government always told the truth, why in the world would you be a socialist? You'd have to have, if the U.S. government was telling the truth about socialism, that it's failed everywhere it's ever been tried, it's always just made things worse, it's resulted in nothing but gulags and death and starvation, why in the world would you be a socialist? You have to be an idiot to be a State Department socialist. I'm sorry, I probably sound like a jerk, but okay. Like, my whole life, all of us have been told over and over and over and over again, Communism failed everywhere it's ever been tried. All it did is lead to hundreds of gajillion, gamillion deaths, and people were poor and starving and miserable. Now, that's so obviously not true. It was socialism that turned Russia and China into superpowers. It's socialism that's made Cuba far more prosperous than most Caribbean countries. Uh, I mean, it's, it's socialism uh, that has done so much, wiped out illiteracy in Bolivia. Socialism has built the world's fastest train. Socialism has built the world's biggest hydroelectrical power plant. Socialism, you know, it made Libya one of the most prosperous countries on the African continent. Socialism works, okay? But, but, if you're an idiot, right, and you think, well, the U.S. government says socialism doesn't work, and if you say socialism doesn't work, that's like Holocaust denial, you know? Saying that socialism works is just like denying the Holocaust. If you're one of those... Why would you be a socialist? I don't get it. Then you're an idiot. I mean, I, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, and, and it's like, I'm just as perplexed as, as the right wing is. They make fun of this. That's not real socialism. Why would you be a socialist? If everywhere socialism has ever been tried, all it's done is misery. Why in the world are you a socialist? Because you'll, you'll get it right this time. You promise, right? I mean, come on, right? This is, this is childish. This is childish, right? Um, I mean, I mean, you have to, in order to really be a socialist, you have to be a tanky on some level, right? Um, you have to be a tanky, or it's just not logical. Uh, I hate to break that to you, but yeah, COVID denialism. I don't think it's it's so much a result of the U.S. educational system as a result of the little boy who cried wolf, but it's also a result of the fact that millions of people are losing their livelihoods right now, and that we have no social safety net, right? We don't have a social safety net, so that not a, so one, the U.S. government has lied. Two people are desperate for this not to be real because they need to go back to work because they're going to not going to be able to feed their kids. You know, we have set up a situation where if something like this happens, a whole bunch of people are destitute. I mean, look at the unemployment numbers right now. Outside of Catholic Charities in, in Queens, New York, the big office of Catholic Charities, there's a huge line every day of working class people, white, black, Latino, desperate, desperate. They have nothing because of this pandemic. You know, these are Uber drivers. These are these are undocumented folks who work. These are these are low income people, and they have been killed by this pandemic. And so, if you're one of those people who is desperately poor, you're not going to think. I mean, I can understand why a low income person might think this was a hoax, and they might say this is just the government trying to screw me. This can't be real. This can't be happening, 
right? Now, the socialist countries, where they have centrally planned economies, like Vietnam, like Cuba, like Venezuela, like China, have handled this way better because they take care of people, right? They don't leave people behind in a situation like this. But if you're a Trump supporter and you, you believe that communism is just this evil ideology that leads to killing millions of people, you couldn't look at that. That can't be true, right? It can't be that socialism's better. So what is the end? Oh, this is a hoax. The government are socialists. That's why they invented it. They want me to be poor, just like in Cuba, you know? And, and it, it fits the Trump mentality, right? right? Because capitalism never makes any mistakes, right? It couldn't be that capitalism, capitalism is not properly set up to handle things like this. No, couldn't be that. Couldn't be that, right? Right? Everyone knows communism's evil. In fact, Democrats are communists. That's why they hate our freedom and hate America. So this must all be a hoax by the Democrats who are communists. Exactly. And Bill Gates, world's richest man, communist. Oh, it all makes sense. Right? And that's, that's basically, that's what COVID denialism is, right? It's a failure to recognize what needs to be recognized. Right? You can compare it to, I, I've talked about this before in recent lives, but I remember when I was in Detroit, when I was working in Detroit against home foreclosures, we would have meetings, mass meetings. Hundreds of people would come and say, I'm, I'm in danger of having my home foreclosed. What do I do? I'm going to lose my home. Um, and we would say, we need to build a mass movement. We have to fight to pass this bill to stop home foreclosures. But there would always be somebody who would come to the meeting and say, actually, they can't foreclose on your home if your ID is written in all capital letters and the lease and, and, and your paperwork for your home is in lowercase letters, they can't evict you because it's not you. And of course, that's not true. No judge is going to do that. No judge is going to be like, oh, it's all capital. But there would always be some idiot. I, I shouldn't say idiot, but some, you know, I don't know what they are. Sovereign citizens or constitutionalists or whatever. These people would come in with this legal knowledge. And these people would be dumb and they would come in and they'd be like, well, actually, you know, you can't lose your home because, you know, well, unless they have, you know, uh, unless they have your, you know, foreclosure notification in your hand, it's technically illegal. And of course that doesn't, but people didn't want to hear build a mass movement. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to hear it because build a mass movement sounds scary. It sounds like protests. It sounds like class struggle. It sounds like being out in the streets. But some wise guy tells me that I can say to the police, well, that's not my name on the form because it's not in all capital letters. That's easier to believe. And people look for the easier way out. For these people that are, are desperate and starving because of the pandemic, right? People that are desperate and starving because of the pandemic. I wrote it down. Um, people that are desperate and starving because of the pandemic and are very anti-communist, it's easier to just say, this is all a hoax. This is a hoax by the Illuminati and the thing up on the thing. It's a conspiracy. It's harder to recognize that we have a problem with capitalism. Right? That, that for some people, it's just this hurdle they don't want to go over. They don't want to go over it. And when people see socialists as just defenders of the status quo, it doesn't help. Uh, but that's another conversation. Just chewing the ice. All righty. Okay. Open borders. Socialist case against open borders. Well, here's the thing, okay? I, I am 100% in favor of immigrants' rights. I think every undocumented immigrant in the United States should immediately be given citizenship. Um, the campaign against undocumented workers is bigoted and awful. Um, you know, anti-immigrant bigotry is horrendous. Um, and this idea that immigrants are to blame for our problems in the United States is absurd. This idea that a crackdown on immigrants is going to somehow protect us from crime is ridiculous because the more the immigrant community is living in the shadows, the more afraid they are to call the police, the stronger groups like MS-13 are going to become. And in fact, a lot of what MS-13 does is smuggle people into the country. So if you make it make it harder for people to legally get into the country. MS-13 is going to make a lot of money illegally smuggling people in. So I am not in favor of an immigration crackdown. I am for full legalization of all the immigrant folks that are already here. I am in favor of giving citizenship to the DACA kids. I, I am not an anti-immigrant bigot. But open borders is not a good slogan. Every country in the world has borders. Okay, Socialist countries have borders. Capitalist countries have borders. And open borders sounds nuts. What does open borders mean? Now, 
to most people when they hear open borders, what they think is, you know, okay, so we're just going to let, we're just going to let anyone walk in, right? Anyone can just walk over the border from Canada and Mexico and they think all the drug dealers, all the terrorists are all just going to walk in and we're not going to stop them, right? Now, I think what people who are communists and leftists mean when they say open borders is they want to get to communism, right? They want to get to the stateless, classless world. That's the ultimate vision that Karl Marx intended, where there's so much material abundance, the need for things like police and military and borders fades away gradually. That's what they mean, I'm sure. But when you say open borders to most people, you sound nuts. The same with prison abolition. You sound nuts, right? They're like, oh, we're just going to let all the pedophiles and murderers and rapists get out. Well, what you mean is we're going to eventually get to communism where we won't need prisons. But, but... To most people, prison abolition sounds like, oh, just let everyone out. Just let all the axe murderers and rapists and pedophiles, let, let them all. It sounds nuts, right? And this is a problem that the left has. They come up with these slogans that sound nuts to average people. Open borders sounds nuts, okay? I am totally in favor of legalization of all the undocumented workers in the United States. I am totally opposed to an immigration crackdown. I am opposed to Trump's wall. I am opposed to ICE and what they're doing right now, separating families, horrendous stuff. But don't use the slogan open borders because it sounds nuts, okay? And I'm sorry if that offends you, right? I'm not trying to get him, I'm not trying to win points with the woke crowd, okay? I'm, I'm out of the movement to the masses, okay? I'm not trying to get woke points, okay? I'm trying to actually convince people that socialism is the answer, okay? So, I mean, I'm sorry if me telling you to stop saying open borders isn't woke enough for you. Okay, and, and you're so much more woke than me. Look in the mirror and masturbate at your own image about how woke you yourself are. I'm telling you that if you keep saying open borders, people that are not already on the left and people that are not already part of, you know, the woke movement or whatever are going to look at you and you look nuts. Now, the same with abolish prisons. Again, I would like to get to a society in which there are no prisons. However, prior to that, I would like us to have socialism and imprison all the billionaires and bankers and, and, and imperialists and warmongers. So, you know, I mean, we're going to have to have a place to put those folks after we have socialism, aren't we? And I think it's going to be a prison. Um, so, yes, in the long term, I want to abolish prisons. In the long term, I want to abolish borders, sure. But it's not a good slogan. Unless people are already Marxists and communists, you sound nuts. Um, and I'm sorry if that, if that if, if you know... Um, if that doesn't impress you, but uh, it's the truth. Socialist countries have prisons. Socialist countries have borders. And until we get to full communism, we're going to have prisons. We're going to have borders. Okay. Um, I'm just being realistic here. So there you go. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, open borders is not a good slogan. And honestly, okay, the immigration conversation needs to change. It needs to change. Okay. The immigration conversation needs to change. Okay. <sighs> Here's the thing. There are millions of people who are desperately poor because of capitalism. The United States has imposed free market neoliberalism on Honduras at the barrel of a gun, right? They overthrew Manuel Zelaya and installed a right-wing extremist regime in Honduras. They overthrew, uh, you know, for decades, they, in military dictatorships, Rios Mont in Guatemala. They've done horrendous things, right? They've done horrendous, horrendous things, you know, in, in Central America. And as a result, millions of people are desperately poor. Mexico has been subject to the drug cartels, U.S.-made weapons, and, and neoliberalism has wrecked Mexico. You know, South, you know South, Central America, South and Central America have been devastated by free market neoliberalism. There's a lot of people who are desperately poor, and the drug gangs and all of that, and they're fleeing, and they need to get out of where they're at, and they're, they're fleeing. And that's not a good situation at all. That is not a good situation. The same with Europe, right? There's many people from Libya, many people from parts of Africa, many people from the Middle East, from Syria, who because of U.S. foreign policy, because of international capitalism and, and free trade and neoliberalism, have been devastated economically and don't have a place to live. And that's not a good situation. It's not a good situation. It is not a good situation, okay? And the way the conversation in the USA goes is like this. There are two sides to it. On the one hand, you have racism. All these people are terrorists. All these people are drug dealers. They're rapists. They're bad hombre. It's this awful, bigoted conversation. Not interested in having that conversation. Not good. Not helpful. It's just bigotry. Fear. 
fear-mongering hate, unacceptable. But then, on the left, the, le the left-wing response to it is, yay, this is the American dream. All these people are coming to a new life. You know, it's amazing. Kumbaya. Wow, let's have, a, let's have a parade to welcome the refugees. Gee golly, it's so great. Look, all these people are starving and fleeing their homelands. Gee golly, it's great. I love it. It's amazing. <laughs> I'm so happy about mass migration. That's what the liberals say. And don't pretend they don't say that. They do that. They do that. And it's disgusting. It's disgusting. It's the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Mass migration is one of the greatest crimes of capitalism. There's all these people who talk about capitalism. You know, communism killed millions of people, and they, like, add up every person in every famine. Let's add up all the people who died because of capitalism and mass migration. Millions of people drowning in the Mediterranean. Millions of dead bodies every day, every single day along the U.S.-Mexico border, they find corpses. Dead bodies of people who died, died trying to get into the country. You're going to tell me this is a good thing? You want me to throw a parade to celebrate mass migration and say, oh, it's so great these people can't live in their homes and are fleeing to the United States where they get treated like criminals and work for low pay? You really want me to celebrate that? You really want me to celebrate? That's like celebrating the Holocaust. That's what that is. If you're celebrating mass migration, that's what you're doing. And these liberals, the reason that they want to celebrate it and they just want to go, yay, mass migration, is they created it. They created it with their you know, revolution against Assad and their revolution against Gaddafi. They created this, right? With their revolution in Venezuela and their revolution, you know, and their neoliberalism and their free market reforms and their free trade and their NAFTA, which we have to support because of global warming, you know, is, you know, they created this. The liberals created this. Republicans created it too, no problem. They created this. So they don't want to talk about the fact that they created a Holocaust. They created millions of people dying. Why are the lobbyists who bailed out some of the businesses given special status and interests and encourages benefits for petrol insurance? Um, all right. I, uh, the lobbyists. Uh, writing it down, Joanne. They created this. They created this. And they don't want to have the conversation that needs to be had about this is what free market capitalism does to the world. This is what Western imperialism does to the world. They don't want to have that conversation. They don't want to have that conversation. They just don't want to have that conversation. So in order to avoid having a conversation they don't want to have, they do this stupid celebration of an atrocity. And, um, and if you don't go along with that celebration, you must be a Nazi. Well, no. You know... What's going on? Anyone who lives near the U.S. and Mexico border will tell you that a lot of bad things are happening near the U.S. Mexico border. And I, I mean, if I lived near the U.S. Mexico border, I would probably be very afraid of MS-13. I'd be probably very afraid of the coyotes that smuggle people in. That doesn't mean I would support Trump. That doesn't mean I would support the wall. But I would have fears of that. And when liberals don't acknowledge any of those problems, when liberals pretend that everything's okay, it's all just great, that's unbelievable. That is unbelievable. And, I, I, you know, it needs to be said. I am saying what needs to be said. You know, Malcolm X and a lot of his speeches, I'm not comparing myself to him. I'm a totally different person from a totally different background in a totally different time. But Malcolm X, in one of his speeches, in many of his speeches, you'll hear Malcolm X say, I know you all don't want to hear this, but... And that's a sign that someone is being real with you. When someone's pandering to you, just telling you what you want to hear, just telling you what's a trendy thing to say in that political circle. Everyone, everyone's happy. But if someone's being real with you, they'll tell you what you don't want to hear. I'm being real with you right now. Open borders is not a good slogan. We have to change the conversation around mass migration. We have to recognize that what's happening is, a, is an atrocity of capitalism. That, that abolish prisons is not a good slogan. Abolish the police is not a good slogan. You know, I'm sorry. But I'm going to tell you what, what you need to hear, what you don't want to hear. That's what Malcolm X used to do. That's what I'm doing to you. So there you go. That's my answer. So I hope that answers your super chat. Any more super chats? I'll happily answer them. I'm having a great time here. It's a thunderstorm outside my window. I don't care. Whatever. All right. 
Someone said, is it worth dealing with Vosh and company? Kind of. I mean, it's it, people people that are open to these kind of politics hear about me more. I've gotten way more subscribers and, and you know, YouTube, Twitter followers in the last few days. It's worth it in some sense. What I find is, is shocking how shallow these people are that have been selected for us. Um, but that shows, I mean, that shows that I, I really don't believe, I really don't believe uh, that, you know, I mean, uh, these people are just randomly, you know, and that's what they flipped out about. Right? Of all the things I've said, the thing that, that got them on my case was suggesting that maybe, maybe people that are interested in socialism didn't randomly pick a guy who sends dick pics to women non-consensually and sits around playing video games as the un unapologetic, undisputable spokesperson of their movement. You know, I mean, maybe. I, I mean, I tend to think socialists are a little smarter than that, that like if you had to pick between, all right, who do we want to represent our movement? You know, sexual predator, uh, you know, college graduate, young, a I mean, I kind of feel like some of these people that have just kind of randomly been selected by the algorithms to represent our movement, maybe they didn't, uh, maybe they didn't, didn't uh, exactly, didn't exactly uh, uh, get chosen completely at random. That's all I said. And that, these people lost their mind. They lost their mind. Just suggesting that. Oh my God. Looks like I touched a nerve. I touched a nerve. And their response is, oh yeah, well he works for RT. And that's, and it's like, everyone knows that. Everyone knows that. I make no secrets about my job. You can, I list where I, every place I've ever worked. You can look at my work, you know. I make no secrets about who I've worked with in the past, who I currently work with. But these people who seem to spend a lot more time attacking genuine leftists than they do attacking capitalism. Just saying. Next question. Are you in favor of a red-brown alliance? No. No. And there is no such thing as a red-brown alliance. And that's something that was made up. And yeah, that's, you know, in case you didn't know, any leftist who doesn't agree with U.S. foreign policy is actually a Nazi. Did you know that? No, totally. Yeah, yeah, you know, and you know, all those people marching against the Vietnam War and waving the Vietnamese flag during the, the Vietnam War, Nazis. And uh, all the people who marched against the Iraq War were denying the Narya testimony, Nazis, and denying weapons of mass destruction, Nazis. No, I am not in favor of a red brown alliance. Red brown alliance is a it's it's a made up stupid talking point. Um and no, I'm not in favor of any alliance with Bra if brown means Nazis, white supremacists, I'm not in favor of any alliance with them. All right. Someone said they don't want the DPRK to have better relations with the United States because of what happened to Libya and, um, and, and such. Well, here's the thing, okay? All right. The DPRK, their economy was actually doing very, very well until the fall of the Soviet Union. You, you know, they've done a lot to cover this up. But, uh, you know, BBC, they have an article where they talk about, and I've, I've quoted this in my lectures and stuff, they talk about the North Korean economic miracle. Because, yeah, in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, North Korea's economy was booming. I mean, huge industrial expansion, huge, you know, electrification, wiped out illiteracy, modernized the country. They did amazing stuff in the 1960s and 70s and 80s. North Korea is the mountainous part of the Korean Peninsula. Right, And they worked very hard to have food independence, but they needed oil. They needed oil for the tractors to run, their, to run their food system. And when the Soviet Union fell, they couldn't buy oil anymore. You could only buy oil in the 1990s with dollars, with petrodollars. Um, and, and the Soviet Union wouldn't sell them oil anymore, and they couldn't get any oil. And as a result, the, the DPRK's food system came to a grinding halt, and millions of people died. In North Korea, they call it the arduous march period. The arduous march is what they refer to it as. It was an awful period in North Korea's history. Millions of people died from malnutrition. Horrendous. Um, and part of the reason that that happened was because they were of the sanctions imposed by the United States. The fact that the United States had, had sanctioned them and basically said, if you trade with us, you can't trade with North Korea, like they've done with Cuba, caused millions of people in North Korea to die. Now, the first thing to remember is that any other government on Earth would have probably f collapsed under that kind of circumstance. When millions of people are dying of malnutrition, the government falls. North Korea's government did not fall. And that shows how well loved and trusted the, 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 the Korean Workers Party is, right? Because I'm sorry, 
governments fall apart under those kind of circumstances. So the fact that the population, you know, of, of North Korea, you know, was able to, you know, still remain loyal to the, the party and the party stayed in power, it kind of shows that the, the North Korean leaders, they, they're, they really, they know how to keep their country locked down. They know how to maintain the loyalty of their population. Love them or hate them. Um, so that's the first thing. But millions of people died because of the United States sanctions. So anything that would enable the people of North Korea to, to have better access to food, to have better jobs and incomes, I'm in favor of. No, you're right, okay? Of course the United States, if it, if it does business with North Korea, is going to try to sneak spies in there. It's going to try to destabilize the place. We know that. That's a, okay, no secret at all. That's going to happen. We know that, right? We know that. Doesn't matter, right? I mean, I think, number one, that the North Koreans know that. They're not stupid. They've been dealing with the USA trying to overthrow them for how many years? They know that. They'll be prepared to deal with it. Second, Russia and China don't want the Korean Workers' Party to fall. They don't want the overthrow of the Korean Workers' Party, so they'll have North Korea's back. Third, um, third, people shouldn't be starving, right? N having the USA have a stranglehold on North Korea, like the USA does now, where North Koreans can't eat. I mean, I mean, now there's not a food crisis anymore, thank goodness. But, you know, I mean, having North Korea impoverished is bad. It's a humanitarian question, right? It is a necessity that North Korea uh, be able to, uh, to trade on the international markets, be able to sell its coal, be able to uh, sell weapons if they want, right? It, it's a necessity. North Korea's got lots of coal. There's lots of people who'd love to buy North Korean coal. They should be able to sell it. Um, it's a necessity that North Korea be able to start, you know, they're very good at making computer technology. They should be able to, to work with companies like Apple and, and uh, um, you know, Microsoft and, and Huawei. They should be able to do it. It's a necessity. It is an absolute necessity that North Korea not be subject to an economic stranglehold anymore. Does that mean that the USA is going to try to get in there and destabilize it? Of course. Does that mean that, that you know, that there's going to be, you know, situations there? Is it possible that maybe even American companies might exploit the labor of North Koreans? Possibly. This is an, a, a humanitarian issue. The stranglehold that North Korea has been subject to must come to an end. The same with Cuba. The stranglehold that Cuba has been subject to must come to an end. Same with Venezuela. The stranglehold on Venezuela must come to an end. The stranglehold on Iran must come to an end. Yeah, I mean... The, the economic warfare that these countries are facing must come to an end. No question about it. It is immoral, especially during a pandemic when you're preventing countries from getting medical supplies and all of that. So, you know, you can say you, you might feel ultra revolutionary there uh, in my friend when you say that you don't want them to have better relations. But I'm telling you, for, for, pe for, for people in North Korea, it is almost a question of life or death, whether or not these sanctions are lifted. These sanctions need to be lifted. End of story. So I'm not with you on that one. I think you're being a little bit ultra left. Uh, I, I, I don't think you understand it. And I think you're underestimating the Koreans. I mean, if they were ever going to be overthrown, it would have been in the 90s. It would have been in the 1990s when millions of people were starving to death, malnutrition. The fact that they, didn't, they did not collapse in 1994 at the height of the food crisis, the fact that they did not collapse at that point probably means, you know, a reform and opening up is not going to kill them. And honestly... I believe, I wrote an article at the time, that the reason that John Bolton and the CIA are desperate to prevent good relations with North Korea is because of the simple fact uh, that they expected that when we had better relations with China and better relations with Vietnam, it would result in the overthrow of the Communist Party. Because that happened all over Europe. When we had better relations you know, with the Soviet Union, eventually the Soviet Union was overthrown. When we had better relations with Romania and Poland and Czechoslovakia, all those governments were overthrown. The USA assumed that would work in Asia. It assumed that, you know, when Jimmy Carter and Deng Xiaoping signed their deal, U.S. companies started going to China, eh, just a matter of time, the Communist Party will be out of power. Well, no, the Chinese Communist Party is way stronger today than it was in the 70s. So the, the Chinese Communist Party has gained more power and, and has become stronger. In Vietnam, same story. They assumed that in the 80s, when Vietnam had its market reforms, the USA is going there, it's doing business, it's only a matter of time, the Communist Party will be out of power in Vietnam. Didn't happen. And I think that the reason that, 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 that Bolton was so desperate to sabotage U.S.-North Korea talks was for the simple reason, the simple reason, the very simple reason that they knew, they knew that there's a very good chance that this wouldn't result in overthrowing the North Korean government and that the North Korean government would probably get stronger. And they know that North Korea funded the Black Panthers and gave support to the Black Panther Party. And they know that, that North Korea gave support to the Palestinians. And they know that, that North Korea supported the FARC. 
and that North Korea, you know, not anymore, but in the 1980s was very, 70s and 80s was very closely associated with a lot of revolutionary communist groups. And they're very, very anti-imperialist, right? I mean, they're, they're, there's, there's not a moderate wing of the Korean Workers' Party. There's not a section of the Korean Workers' Party that says, eh, communism is just a nice idea. Let's have free markets. There's none of that, right? There's no, there's no like, communist in name only wing of the Korean Workers' Party. You have a little bit of that in China. You got a little bit of that in Vietnam. You don't have any of that in North Korea. None of it. None of it. So I think that's why John Bolton was desperate, so desperate to kill the talks, is because they realized it would probably ultimately strengthen the Korean Workers' Party. All right. Is Eritrea socialist? I don't know. Um, I know that the party in Eritrea that is the ruling party uh, is, it, it, so here's the thing. Okay, so Ethiopia, right? You have to remember Eritrea used to be part of Ethiopia, right? Ethiopia was ruled by the dictator Haile Selassie, the emperor of Ethiopia. Um, you know, Haile Selassie was toppled and overthrown by the Derg, which was a Marxist-Leninist faction within the military, a pro-Soviet Marxist-Leninist faction in Ethiopia took power in 1978. So Ethiopia's government became, you know, a pro-Soviet Marxist government. Um, so then... Eritrea, there had been an armed struggle in Eritrea for independence for a long time. And, it, and when the Derg took power, there was a split. The pro-Soviet wing of the, of the Eritrean movement, uh, they said, you know, we will be part of Ethiopia, we'll just have federal autonomy, and they were aligned with the Derg. The Maoists, the Maoists in Eritrea uh, didn't agree with that, and they continued to fight against the pro-Soviet government. And they started getting weapons from China to fight the Derg and from, and from the, the United States CIA. So the CIA backed the current Eritrean ruling party to fight and eventually win its independence from the Derg, from the ruling party of Ethiopia. Now, the party that's currently in power in Eritrea is the Maoist party that was supported by China and the CIA. And now the U.S. government really hates them and calls them the North Korea of Africa. And China and Russia seem to be friendlier to Eritrea. Um, they don't seem to emphasize socialism very much. They don't have very much. They're very, very poor. Um, they seem to be more Islamic in their orientation. I don't really know. I, I'm not, I don't know if their politics is still socialist politics. I especially don't know enough about their economy to tell you whether it's socialist. I would say Eritrea is an anti-imperialist state, uh, that is aligned with the anti-imperialist bloc. I don't know enough about, you know, what is actually taking place on the ground to tell you economically what's going on there. I do know it's an anti-imperialist country, but it's complicated because it's an anti-imperialist country that came into existence because the imperialists were trying to fight against the Derg. So it's complicated. I, I can't give you a full answer there. All right, so I was asked about McCarthyism and is a new McCarthyism emerging? Well, you know, McCarthyism, you know, it's a word that gets thrown around. Um, have you seen what's happening with Lakota now? I haven't, actually. Um but I'll write it down and we'll get to that later. I haven't seen what's happening uh, with Lakota now, but um, you know, right now there is a new McCarthyism. You're supposed to hate everything associated with Russia. Um, and what's weird is that they are trying to marginalize, they're trying to make leftism, they're trying to completely wipe out any Marxist, Leninist and anti-imperialist and genuine socialist influence on the left and make the synthetic left completely ideologically dominant. Uh, they, they, they've basically taken the worst aspects of the 1960s new left and they're trying to make that all that leftism is. They've made leftism into a destructive, uh, a destructive cult of people that love chaos. And they're trying to erode any ML Marxist influence and declare all actual Marxism to be fascism. Uh, so I think that's the new McCarthyism. But, you know, the right, they, everyone they don't like is a communist. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, McCarthyist influence is everywhere, for sure. Absolutely. Trey Gowdy as president of the United States. Could it happen? Is that true? Hillary Clinton, was that true? I am Trey Gowdy. Was that true? I mean, I mean, I, he's very popular among Republicans. I could see it happening. I'm not too impressed with the fellow. Um, I believe he's from Texas, if I'm not mistaken. And I believe Texas, if I, you know, is having some, uh, is having, you know, there's, there's some Texas separatism going on, right? There's a lot of like kind of Trump and military people in Texas who want Texas to break away from the United States. I hope that doesn't happen, but, you know, but those kind of movements exist. So, oh, he's in South Carolina. Sorry. Well, there you go. I mean, Trey Gowdy, 
um, yeah, I mean, whatever. Yeah, I mean, I know who he is, you know, um, and, uh, you know, I mean, he seems like the kind of guy that's very popular with the Trump crowd. I'll tell you that much. Um, and he, he grilled Hillary Clinton, so, yeah. Okay. Okay, so... The Muslim Brotherhood. I was asked about the Muslim Brotherhood. Okay, so the Muslim Brotherhood, um, you have to go back to the 1920s. Uh, the 1920s, the Middle East, uh, at that point, you know, people still called it the Near East back then. It wasn't the Middle East, it was the Near East. Um, and, uh, you know, that's near to what? Like, it's Western chauvinism. But regardless, you know, the Middle East back in the 1920s, you, you had the rise of, um, you know, you had the rise, for example, of like in, in Turkey, you know, there was Ataturk, um, you know, and Ataturk was very much, you know, opposed to a religious government, was very secular, was very much a nationalist. Um, you had, he was in Turkey, um, Sierra, Western Sahara conflict. I'm not following it. I'm writing it down. All right. You know, and you also had the rise of Marxism in the Middle East. Um, you know, you had Marxist parties. And uh, so in the Middle East, there was this this feeling that there was Westernization in the Middle East, that a lot of Middle Eastern companies were being pushed to become, quote, unquote, Westernized. Um, so there was kind of a response to it. Um, and the Muslim Brotherhood emerged as a group of, you know, it's mainly small business owners in the Middle East that are opposed to any government uh, that is, that is um, any government, any government that, that is nationalist, any government that is socialist, they're religious. And so they don't believe in Arab nationalism, but they also, at the same time, they're really opposed to Marxism and socialism. Um, and they're, they're, they're conservative business owners, right? It's, it's a political movement that emerged. It started in the 20s, but it really got going in the 1950s because in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood was very strong and Abdel Nasser, the Arab socialist who was aligned with the Soviet Union, was in power. And so the Muslim Brotherhood became the main center of resistance to Abdel Nasser. Um, they carried out terrorist attacks and assassinations. Um, and it's small business owners um, and they you know, do a lot of charity work and feed poor people. Um, and then they tend to use those poor people as foot soldiers. I, I don't support the Muslim Brotherhood. I think it's very bad. Um, you know, I mean, and, and during World War II, from what I understand, there were a lot of pro-Hitler statements made by the Muslim Brotherhood, right? Um, and the Muslim Brotherhood basically are their fanatical anti-communists. They worked with the CIA in the past, but they'll, they do their own thing. Very anti-Israel, right? Um, you know, they're very anti-Israel. In fact, Hamas is the Palestinian wing of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, you know, but Obama, the Obama administration was very much all about using the Muslim Brotherhood as foot soldiers against socialism. The USA did that in Syria. The USA did that in Iraq. The USA has done that in different countries. It's used the Muslim Brotherhood to fight socialism. Um, but the Trump administration seems to hate the Muslim Brotherhood. And the Saudis, the Wahhabi Saudis, and the Muslim Brotherhood hate each other also. The Muslim Brotherhood, small business owners... And they tend to be in favor of, you know, an elected government. They tend to favor technology um, and such. Whereas the Saudis tend to be very, 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 very much in favor of an autocratic regime. Well, we have a year of lead. Oh, my God. All right. And... Um, you know, so there's there's some pretty solid and clear differences. Um, and the Muslim Brotherhood and the Saudis hate each other. The Muslim Brotherhood is actually illegal in Saudi Arabia. You can get the death penalty for being a member of it in Saudi Arabia. And um, so there's some differences. There's a rivalry between the two groups. Obama, Obama, Obama was basically trying to align with both, though he kind of favored the Muslim Brotherhood. The Saudis, uh, at this point, Trump is for the Saudis, and he's tense. He's even talked of declaring the Muslim Brotherhood to be terrorists. He's even considered putting them on the terror list. So, you know, there's there's a clear difference. I think it's the CIA that is closer to the Muslim Brotherhood, and it's the weapons manufacturers that are closer to the Saudis. So I think that's the division. The Pentagon likes the Saudis. The CIA likes the Muslim Brotherhood. But, yeah, Turkey and Qatar, uh, those two governments are the primary funders of the Muslim Brotherhood at this point. So, yeah. Um, I think that that answers the question. Are there other Marxist-Leninists I'd be willing to debate? 
I mean, yeah, but it would be a friendly debate. It wouldn't be a hostile debate. But yeah, I mean, if there was a topic that some, some other Marxist wanted to debate with me, I'd do it. I, I wouldn't want to debate a party. I don't think that would be a good thing. It was like Caleb Maupin versus PSL, Caleb Maupin versus the Communist Party. I would, I would really never want to do that. Um, but in terms of, you know, I mean, if there's another, if there's some topic people wanted to debate, I'd be open to it. I'm kind of, you know, I, I, I did a whole bunch of debates there. I did a whole string of them and I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of worn out on debates, uh, for now. I want to, I want to have conversations with people, but maybe we'll do a debate. I mean, I, I, I approached modern day debates about possibly debating one of their evangelical thinkers, um, about was Jesus a socialist? Why were social Democrats called social fascists? Okay. I'll talk about that. And I, and I, I would like to have that debate. So if they can find someone to have that debate, I would be willing to do it. Uh, you know, I'm kind of burned out on debates for the moment, but I, I'll probably do it again. I'll probably do it again because it's worth doing. Uh, but yeah, um, you know, there you go. Okay. Why I hate Trotskyists? Well, because Trotskyists align with U.S. imperialism. That, it's that simple. Um, you know, I mean, anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world that you go, U.S. imperialism will be on one side, genuine Marxist, Leninist, and anti-imperialists will be on the other side, and Trotskyists will be on the same side as the U.S. imperialists. That simple. Uh, you know, Ukraine. Take Ukraine, for example, right? The U.S. government is aligned with the ultra-nationalist Kiev regime that is tearing down World War II memorials. Well, the Communist Party and the, 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 progressive, uh, what is it, the, the progressive Socialist Party, all the, like, tanky groups of Ukraine are against the U.S.-imposed regime, but they're, the stupid Trotskyists are on the side of the U.S. imperialists. Uh, you know, I mean, Venezuela, right? Venezuela. Even though Hugo Chavez quoted Trotsky, even though Maduro has even criticized Stalin, doesn't matter. All the Trotskyists in Venezuela are trying to overthrow Maduro, just like the U.S. imperialists are. All the tankies in Venezuela are on the side of Maduro. Um, wherever you go in the world, Trotskyists are on the side of the imperialists. Now, there's an exception. Somebody will point to ultra-Trotskyists, right? Ortho-Trotskyists, people like the Spartacist League. And it's like, sure, okay, yeah. There's like fringe Trotskyists that, that are so committed to sticking to what Trotsky actually said that they will sometimes take the right position. Like the Spartacist League in the United States, when it came to the Ukraine crisis, they took the side of, of opposing the Kiev regime. Most Trotskyists didn't. Um, you know, in Syria, other places, like there's some exceptions. Like the World Socialist website, they're Trotskyists, but they tend to take anti-imperialist positions. But they're the exception, not the rule. Overwhelmingly, Trotskyists are on the side of U.S. imperialism. And that's, you know, and largely, I mean, Trotskyists echo the imperialist narrative about the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was hell on earth. It was this, you know, brutal, evil regime. It wasn't really socialist, you know. I mean, that's, that's, you know, and that's why. And that's why I'm not a fan of Trotskyism. And you should go on Rising the Hill. Oh, yeah, I'd love to go on there. I'd love to go on that show. Yeah. Uh, make it happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, that that's why people don't like Trotskyists. That's why they don't like Trotskyists. It's because Trotskyists tend to be on the side of the U.S. government. It's that simple. Um, you know, um, Trotsky was a traitor to the Soviet Union, right? He was working with the imperialists and the fascists to demonize the Soviet Union. Um, but most people that become Trotskyists don't become Trotskyists because they care about what Trotsky actually said or wrote. They want to just be anti-Soviet. They're cowards. They're wimps. They're punks. Um, and they've heard anti-communism their whole life. And so when they tell their friends they're a communist or they tell somebody they know they're a communist, they immediately say, what? You mean like Stalin? Like Mao? Like Fidel Castro? And they go, oh, no, no. I'm not like the bad kind. I'm a good communist. I'm a Trotskyist. Oh, no, I'm not like the bad ones. And their friends go, oh, okay, that's fine. No, their friends go, well, you, yeah, but that doesn't make any sense. You know, um, it's just a concession, right? It's just a way of saying it's cowardly. It's childish. It's trying to appease the enemy. If I call myself a Trotskyist, they won't demonize me for being a socialist. And it doesn't work that way. So, but it's, yeah, it's just silly. Um, you know, I mean, I've studied a lot of Trotsky's writings. I was in a group that had Trotskyist roots at one point. What was weird was the group had Trotskyist roots, but it was constantly being called Stalinist because none of our positions aligned with the U.S. government. It didn't matter that we had Trotskyist roots. We were just called Stalinist because, you know, whatever. And like Marxism, right? Marxism, right, which is the, that's the Workers' World Party and PSL, their history is Trotskyist. But it doesn't matter. People call them Stalinist anyway because 
being a Trotskyist at this point is about aligning with the U.S. imperialists. And being a Stalinist at this point means you're anti-imperialist. So that kind of shows that it doesn't really matter. I think people should study Trotsky and his writings, right? Um, it's worth studying and knowing what he said. You know, there's plenty of truth in some of the things he said. Um, but he himself was not a good person. And he represented that petty bourgeois deviation within Marxism. Uh, he represented the revolutionary intelligentsia. Um, and, and he was very much in love with the West, right? He said, New York City is the foundry where the fate of mankind will be forged. Lenin said that the future, the future of socialism in that time, in the 20th century, was in the East. Trotsky would not recognize that. He hated Russia. He hated Ukraine. He hated the peasantry. He hated the third world. He was in love with the Western world. He was a self-hating Russian, a self-hating Ukrainian. Um, and he thought the West was the best. He really believed that. Um, so, you know, I mean, he was wrong. And that's why he couldn't lead the Soviet Union. So, you know, I mean, Stalin rose to power because Stalin had gone to seminary school. Joe Koval struck me. Whoa, somebody repeat that. That was a big super chat, but I want to get it right. Um, somebody repeat that. I, I don't want to miss it. Something about Joe Koval. I don't even know who that is, but repeat the super chat. I, I want to let this person get an answer. Repeat it, please. Repeat it, please. Let me give this person an answer. They deserve an answer. Someone repeat that super chat. Please repeat the super chat. Jo uh, not a hippy dippy synthetic leftist made strong anti growth eco socialist arguments in Imagine Living in a Socialist USA. Okay, all right. Eco socialism. I haven't read that book. USA, no growth. I will give you a response, good sir. Thank you for asking the question. Gonna have to wrap this up pretty soon because I have some other obligations here. But um, alrighty, so that's that's the issue with Trotskyism. Someone asked me about Dugin. I mean, Dugin's a thinker in Russia. I mean, I, you know, I mean, if people want to see what I said when I spoke on a panel with him at the Alternatives to Globalization Conference, take a look at it. Um, you know, um, he's a traditionalist conservative. He's not a fascist. Um, you know, his beliefs, he refers to what he calls the fourth political theory. Um, if you read his book, The Fourth Political Theory, uh, he argues that liberalism is the first political theory. Communism was, was the second political theory. Fascism is the third political theory. He is, argues that he's developing something called the fourth political theory. Um, so, yeah, he's not a fascist, um, you know, because, and, and, you know, he's right wing, he's conservative, but he's not a fascist. He repudiates fascism, um, you know, and people want to, like, you know, take a quote from him. I'm not his lawyer. I'm not here to defend him. Um, you know, anti-communist family, writing it down. You know, he has his beliefs. I have mine. I don't agree with him on a, many points, but I mean, there, his work is worth looking into. I mean, if you want to understand how anti-imperialists around the world who are not oriented toward Marxism think, I mean, that's what, that's what they think. Um, and that, that the, like the idea that he's toxic, he's, oh my God, you spoke to Dugan. <gasps> You know, child, grow up, please. Grow up, please. You know, so what? I met with Dugan. So what? So what? So what? Right? So what? Um, you know, I mean, that's all there is to it. I mean, you know, and, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, that's all I want to say about that. Um, now, now, I was asked by Joanne about lobbyists in the insurance and petrol industries. Yeah. Lobbyists on Capitol Hill have a lot of power, and they, they write policy. I mean, and, and that's been a complaint of many, many populist Bernie Sanders kind of people, is the amount of influence that big, big corporations and, and lobbyists have, you know. And, yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm with you. I don't know. What's going on with the Lakota now? Someone said something's going on with the Lakota now. Tell me about it. What's going on? Um, what's going on? What's going on with the Lakota? I don't know what's going on. I'll have to look up, look it up because I, I, I don't know what's going on and no one's telling me in the chat, so I can't react to it. I'm sorry, I am not following the Western Sahara conflict, so I can't give you a complete thorough answer. I know the imperialists have worked very, very hard to keep Africa divided, uh, to keep it poor, divided, and underdeveloped so they can control it and control its resources. Can you talk about Jural Zelsky? I don't even know who that is. I don't know who Jural Zelsky is, so I can't talk about it. All right. Um, years of lead in the USA. Well, the years of lead, that refers to in Italy. Um, you know, and 
that was in Italy um, when the U.S. government was working very, very hard to prevent the Communist Party from taking power. The Communist Party, you know, had fought the fascists. They were the main, main anti-fascist resistance party. Um, they had formed the partisan brigades that had fought against Mussolini in the streets. They'd done a lot of really heroic stuff. Um, and because of that, um, the Communist Party was very, very popular in the 50s and 60s. So the CIA worked really, really hard to rig the Italian elections to prevent the communists from coming to power. It was called Operation Gladio, and it's now a matter of public record. Um, and it was Operation Gladio. Um, and one of the things that they did, the reason they called it the Year of Lead, because Years of Lead, was because there was all kinds of terrorism that happened. Um, the CIA funded uh, some Maoist terrorist groups to go around and commit terrorist attacks to discredit communists, right? Because communism was popular. So they funded these like ultra left Maoist groups. A lot of the members probably didn't even know they were being funded. They thought they were like legit, but they, they were being covertly supported by, by the West and by Western capitalism to destabilize and to discredit the communist party. They also funded fascist groups to kill communists, right? And that, that not, you know, fascist groups that admired Mussolini were going around and assassinating communists as well. And there was just a lot of killing and shooting between fascists and communists in Italy, ultra-left communists doing terrorist attacks, fascists killing communist party members. It was an all-out effort by the CIA to manipulate the political situation in, in Italy to prevent the communist party from winning the election. And what's interesting is it didn't work. What worked, they, it, it, they eventually did defeat the Italian Communist Party and prevent it from ever coming to power, but they didn't do it by funding terrorists to shoot at it. They didn't do it by funding the ultra-left bombers. They did it by, by funding, you know, the, the, the um, what do they call, the, uh, the Euro-Communists. That, the Euro-Communists, are ultimately who defeated, who defeated Italian Communism. 1979, or 78, the Italian Communist Party, the Spanish Communist Party, the Portuguese Communist Party, I believe, uh, the French Communist Party, got together and signed a declaration denouncing the Soviet Union and basically announcing they didn't really want to have socialism anymore. They just kind of were social democrats. Um, and that, that moment really is why the Italian Communist Party fell apart. It was infiltrated. And a lot of the members were professors and people that got grant money from CIA foundations. And, it, and the term Euro-communist was actually coined by Zbigniew Brzezinski. It was the Carter administration. They didn't assassinate Italian communists. I mean, they did assassinate a lot of Italian communists, but that didn't work. They, they, they also funded the ultra-left groups to make communists look bad. That didn't work. The main way they got rid of, and it wasn't the Portuguese Communist Party. I misspoke. They are a little more, more hardline. But the way that they ultimately destroyed Italian communism was by infiltrating it, by funding it, by using grant, found, grant foundation money and stuff to just you know completely ideologically bankrupt it. Um, you know, and, and fill it up with liberals, right? Um, that's the way they, they overthrew and, and de you know, so that's, that's what you have to remember. Would the years of lead happen in the United States? Well, I sure as hell hope not. You know, I really hope not because, yeah, not good, not good. Terrorist attacks, violence in the country, ultra-leftist groups blowing shit up, uh, you know, right-wing fascists killing communists, not a good thing, not a good thing. So I really hope not, but I mean, in a way you could argue it's, I mean, Charlottesville and I mean, there are things happening in the United States that are kind of reminiscent of the years of lead. So, you know, I mean, you're, I, I'm saying, I hope it doesn't happen. You know, I favor a peaceful transition to socialism. I don't believe in violence. I don't want violence to happen. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. And thanks Arthur for taking care of business. I appreciate it. You know, got to keep things clean. Okay, why were social democrats called social fascists? Well, if you're familiar with these lives, I've answered this question many times, but I'll answer it again. There used to be an old song. The cloak makers union is a no good union. It's a company union by the bosses. Those right wing cloak makers, they are socialist fakers who play upon the workers double crosses. The Hillquits, Dubinskys, and the Thomases they make to the workers false promises. They preach socialism, but they practice fascism to preserve capitalism for the bosses. And that was a Communist Party USA song, a little nursery rhyme that they had about the Cloakmakers Union of New York City. And the Cloakmakers Union was run, um, was run by the Socialist Party of America, and the Communist Party USA felt that the social... Socialist Party of America, that they preached socialism, but they practiced fascism to preserve capitalism for the bosses. 
And what that was about was that, that you know, 1928, the Communist International, the Communist International had its, seventh, its sixth World Congress, and they declared that they had entered what they called the Third Period. And that meant they argued that following the Russian Revolution, the first period had been a wave of revolutions around the world in Germany and Hungary and elsewhere. Then they had a period of capitalist stabilization. But then 1928, as the Great Depression was coming on, that was the beginning of the third period, which would be the period in which socialism expanded and revolutions would take place. And they argued that in the third period, the main danger was social Democrats. You know, Ramsey MacDonald, who was a socialist, a Labour Party guy in England, a vehement anti-communist, right? And he was a socialist. And he said, well, I'm a socialist and we got a, you know, the Socialist Party in the USA, they had a slogan, the main enemy is on the left, referring to the Communist Party. The Socialist Party passed in the labor unions, the American Federation of Labor, the AFL, in the unions that they controlled, uh, they had a ban, no Communist Party can join, can join any labor union that, that you was know, part of the AFL. So, the Socialist Party was considered to be the main roadblock to revolution. So based on that, um, you know, communists around the world started calling social democrats social fascists, arguing that they, are fa they preach socialism but practice fascism. And in Germany, you know, there were many massacres where the Social Democratic Party, you know, would be in control of a city like Berlin, right? In, in May, Day, May Day 1929, in the Wedding district of Berlin, there was a massacre of Communist Party supporters, uh, and it was done mainly by police that were in the Social Democratic Party. And um, yeah, these things happen. So, yeah, I mean, that was what it was about, and it was a mistaken policy. I don't think they should have used the word social fascist. I think that they should have, they should have, you know, it was correct to challenge the Social Democrats. The Social Democrats were their main threat at that point. Um, but social fascist was a little bit hyperbolic. Like, it was making it sound like there's no difference between Social Democrats and Hitler, and there clearly was. But they didn't know that. Hitler hadn't come to power yet. So, you know, I think that's what that was about. And that's what that, that was about. And, you know, you'll remember then, in 1935, um, in 1935, the Communist International had the Seventh World Congress, and they reversed their position. And they said that Social Democrats were not fascists, and that it was necessary for Communists and Social Democrats to merge into a single electoral party. Um, you know, and they tried very hard. The Communist Party and the, the Social Socialist, uh, the Communist Party wanted the Socialist Party to merge into the Farmer Labor Party. The Communist Party wanted to have a joint electoral ticket in 1936 between Earl Browder and Norman Thomas. Norman Thomas said no, so they had separate presidential campaigns. But the policy of the Communist Party in 1936 changed from being opposed to any unity with Social Democrats, saying Social Democrats were fascists, to aligning with them against the actual fascists. So, you know, I mean, they they probably went a little bit over the top with the, the opposition to the Social Democrats, um, and that helped Hitler come to power, and uh, that's a legit criticism. I can believe some of that. Um, but the Social Democrats also were way over the top with their anti-communism. Um, you know, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's it was, the, you know, it, it, was, it was a situation. Uh, the 1920s and 30s is way in the past. We're in a totally different situation right now. Um, and there's a big difference. The synthetic left of today is very different than social democrats, right? The social democrats were Marxists, right? They were just reformist Marxism. They, they believed in a watered down, non-revolutionary version of Marxism. They still believed in historical progress. They still wanted the means of production to be centrally planned and controlled by society. They still believed in class struggle. They still believed in advancing the means of production and technology. They still believed in economic growth. Uh, the synthetic left of today doesn't believe in any of that stuff. They believe growth is bad, that people should stay poor, number one. Number two, uh, they believe that, uh, that any, any, any belief in truth and objective reality is fascist and Nazi. They believe that the socialist countries are the equivalent of Nazi Germany. Um, so the synthetic left of today and the social democrats of the 30s are like, like apples and oranges. They're two different animals, two different animals. There's a big, big difference between the two. All righty. Ugh. All right. So someone said, they asked about eco-socialism, and, and I need to read this book, Living in the Socialist USA. I haven't read it. I've seen it widely advertised. Um, but they're arguing that there was somebody in this book who doesn't seem like an anti-communist or a synthetic leftist, but they're arguing for eco-socialism and no-growth politics. Well, 
The thing is, okay, eco-socialism, I don't have a problem with. In fact, I would say that China is the cutting edge of eco-socialism. China is making more solar panels than anybody else. China is funding the most important eco-socialist project, which is fusion energy, right? If you can get the world off of fossil fuels, you know, climate change will be very, very much rolled back. Um, you know, you know, I mean, China is very much at the center of trying to have eco-socialism. I mean, Venezuela has done amazing stuff. Uh, they have a lot of conferences, change the climate, not the, or change the system, not the climate. And I actually did an interview with a leader, a Venezuelan um, diplomat about their environmental socialism policies a few years back. And, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I'm all, all in favor of being better to the environment. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being good for the environment. Global warming is a serious problem we need to overcome. The idea that growth is bad, that is where you lose me. Growth is not bad. Growth is not bad. Growth is good. And the goal is to get to a society with so much material abundance, so much prosperity, that there's no need for any state. You're not going to be, if you believe growth is bad, you'll, you need to stop being a Marxist. You're never going to have Marxism. Never. Right? You're never going to have socialism. Um, you're, I mean, it's just not going to happen. Gun control, writing it down. It's not going to happen. Um, not going to happen. Because of the simple fact that, that growth is necessary for socialism. So, yeah, I mean, you're not going to have socialism and, and socialism is an ideology based on growth. Human beings are species that believe in growth. We need to grow more efficiently, but, but saying that growth is bad, that is, that is Malthusian ideology. Um, you know, overpopulation, all of that. Anti-growth politics is the definition of reactionary. It is the definition of reactionary. Fascism is anti-growth. If you want, if you don't believe me, go and get a book by Julius Evola, and it's called Man Among Ruins. Julius Evola was a fascist sympathizer, uh, widely published, you know, a, a voice of the Italian fascist regime, and he wrote a whole essay that he published called, called The Demonic Nature of the Economy, where he argues that growth is satanic, and it's demonic because it, it, it makes people work hard and makes them not happy with their place in life. And that it's so beautiful, he argues, that in these third world countries, people don't want anything. And they just accept the fact that they're poor and they believe in reincarnation. So instead of working hard to get ahead in this life, they're just happy to be, and, and they hope they'll be reincarnated into a better life for them. And it's so amazing that no one believes in growth in the third world. And that's so what's so amazing about Tibet and the Indian caste system. This is fascism. No growth politics is fascism. It's reactionary. How, how do you reduce human growth? You reduce the population, you reduce the living standards of the people that are there. No growth politics is no good. I am vehemently opposed to all no growth politics. You know, that said, am I opposed to environmentalism? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Environmentalism is good. I'm all in favor of environmentalism. I'm all in favor of, of you know, and, and we need socialism for that reason so that we can have growth that's sustainable. We need sustainable growth. Growth under capitalism is deeply irrational, and it eats up resources in whatever is in the short-term interest of the capitalist. But if we had a centrally planned economy, we could strategically use our resources and, and fund things in a way that it would be sustainable and it wouldn't result in ecological problems like we have now. So I think that's an answer to your question. How do you deal with your anti-communist family? Well... I hate to say this because I know it's really hard, especially now with the pandemic and so many people being unemployed. But if you're an adult, you're 18, you need to move out. I hate to break it to you. You need to move out. Um, you know, you need to move out. I mean, if you're living at home, I don't know who's asking this. If you're living at home, right, you need to move out. You need to have your own place, right? I, I, and I mean, maybe that's not possible for you. And I know for millennials, it's very hard. For for Zoomers, it's very hard. The economy, it, maybe it's not possible. But ultimately... If you're a communist and your family is anti-communist, right? Or even if you're, even if it has nothing to do with politics, right? One of the most important things for young people to do is move out. Living with your parents, living with your parents past the age of 18 is not healthy. I'm just telling you, um, you know, and you know, if, if, if you're worried about being happy, if you're worried about having self-respect, I'm urging you, you know, I'm not saying you should cut yourself off from your family. Talk to your family. Maintain a relationship. You need to have your own place. You need to not live at home when you're 18. I'm just telling you. Um, you won't be happy. And I know a lot of younger people, and the source of a lot of the sadness that a lot of younger people have 
uh, is rooted in the fact that they're living at home and is rooted in the way their parents judge them. You know? So I'm just telling you, um, especially if your family is judging you for being a communist, thinks that it's a sign of mental illness, which is really common, really common. Um, you know, that, oh, you know, he likes the Soviet Union. He must be crazy because everybody knows. That's how normal people think. I mean, let's be real. So if your family's judging you for being a communist, doesn't respect your activism, you need to live on your own and you need to not be financially dependent on them. Um, I mean, it's that simple. Um, and once you're on your own and, and financially independent, I think you'll come to realize your family will probably respect your politics more. They won't see it as you being immature. They won't see it as you being a screw up. They'll see it as, oh, okay, well, he lives on his own. Um, you know, he's got his own place. He's supporting himself financially and he has these beliefs. Okay. I think that, that that's the case. And I think that the curse of our generation, as I said in, in, in many times before, is that a lot of young people are deprived of the ability to quote unquote grow up in the economic sense, to you know, buy their own home, have children, get married. They feel kind of trapped by the low wage economy. And because they're like trapped by the low wage economy, um, that leads to them feeling a lot of shame and feeling like, um, you know, feeling humiliated. I'm not saying people should cut off with their family. I'm not saying that. I would never tell anyone to cut off with their family. Never, right? Now, in my case, I did that a little bit and it helped me, but honestly, you, you should never, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not telling people to defoo or anything like that. I would never do that, right? But I'm telling you that as an adult, right, as a young adult, you need to establish your own independence. You need to live on your own, maintain a relationship with your family. But, you know, um, you know but I, I would urge you, I would urge you to maintain your relationship with your family, but, but live independently. And the more that you live on, on your own, the more that you have your own job, you pay your own bills, the more self-respect you're going to have. You won't be feel humiliated. You won't feel like a burden. You won't feel like, like you're a screw-up. And the more that your parents will have to respect you, right? So that's my advice to you. And it's not easy. It's not easy, right? I mean, I'm white. You know, I, I didn't come from a rich family, but I'm, I'm white. I, you know, I come from a background. I have had it easier than a lot of people in this country. You know, so for me to just say, oh, you need to be on your own, and you're like, what am I going to do? You know, I went to a decent college, you know, so it's hard, okay? And I'm not here to tell you that, uh, that it's easy and, oh, you just do this and this will solve your problems. But that's my advice. If you have an anti-communist family, my advice would be to figure out how to be out on your own. And I think they'll come to respect you more. Um, but if you're not out on your own, and maybe you are out on your own. I don't even know who asked this question. This person could be asking, this could be a parent talking about their anti-communist kid for all I know. I shouldn't assume it's a young person. I shouldn't assume that, right? Maybe that's condescending on my part. Look. You know, you can pick your friends, you can pick your political group views, you can't pick your family. You know, your family, you're born into this family, that's it. So, you know, do what you want to do. I mean, I have given up trying to convert or convince my family of anything. I have. I am not trying to convince my family of anything. Because my relationship with my family is not based on them agreeing with me and my political views. And... I, I kind of gave up on ever hoping that I would get them to respect my political views. And it's worked to some degree, right? Your family, they're your family. They're not your, they're not your best buds. They're not your comrades. They're your family. And, uh, you know, if being a communist is a very big part of your identity, you know, be their kid, be their, be your parents' kid, be your sister's brother, be your brother's sister, you know, but maintain your own political views. I mean, no one's, you know, I mean, I, th I think that's, that's all there is to it. Um, so yeah, I mean, and it's tough, but, um, you know, honestly though, let me just tell you this truth and I'm probably going to offend some people if they're watching, but maybe not being from an anti-communist family in a way puts you at an advantage because it means that you're actually going to take this really seriously. I know people who grew up as quote unquote red diaper babies all right, the parents were communists. They don't understand how important this is. All right? First of all, in my experience, you know, a lot of this, the hippies, the new left, their parents had been CPUSA, Communist Party members. They became, you know, Maoists or, or SDS, Trotskyists, whatever. But I'm talking about, like, people from my generation, millennials. People whose parents were communists, they tend to not get it. 
you know, and there's great exceptions to this. There's a very big exceptions to this. But in my experience, people whose parents were new left communists, were like SDS or Maoists or Trotskyists, they tend to just not get it. They tend to just, you know, they, they grow up kind of resenting it. Because when you're like a small child, you don't understand communism. You don't understand it when you're a small child. And they kind of feel jealous. In some cases, they feel neglected. They feel like the parents gave more attention to communism than they gave to them. There's a French movie called Blame It on Fidel that kind of gets into some of this. Um, so I've met that. Many times I've met younger people who their parents were communists. And they feel, they feel kind of neglected. And they kind of resent communism. Um... You know, that's common. That's very common. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, I've met younger people that are red diaper children, that it's, they don't understand it. They grew up around it. They take it for granted. Um, they, they, they don't feel a need to go out and study Marx. They don't feel a need to go and study Lenin or, or, or engage in these debates because, you know, it's not necessary. Right? It's just kind of, yeah, okay, capitalism's bad. What Big whoop. What's the big... I mean, they, they don't understand how important it is. So if you're somebody who doesn't come from a communist family, like myself, and you actually go and investigate this stuff, right, and you learn it for real, it is going to have far more importance to you than it'll ever have to someone who came from a communist family because you sought it out. You went looking for it. You studied it, you learned it, you grasped it, you rejected anti-communism and came to communist conclusions. So for you, I'm telling you, in a way you're lucky. Because for you, communism is going to be way more meaningful for you than it was for people who came from communist families. For you, it's going to be a much bigger part of your identity. And so in a way, you know, in a way there's a, there's a mild silver lining to this. Um... And I hope that that's a helpful answer uh, to your question. Um, you know, um, I, I mean, I've even heard stories of people who recruited their parents. I don't recommend trying to do that, but I've heard, I mean, people, have, I've heard of people recruiting their parents, recruiting their family, recruiting their brother and sister. Um, you know, I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, weird things happen. Every family is different. You have to remember that. Every family is different. Every family is different. Um... Frontier Services Group, owned by Eric Prince of Blackwater, is doing security contracts for China and Africa and on the Chinese mainland. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know that, uh, that Eric Prince of Blackwater went to Venezuela and was trying to cut a deal with them as well, I believe. Um, you know, so it doesn't surprise me. Um, you know, let me tell you a story before I get off the... Um, I'm going to write Blackwater in China. Before I get off this kick of um, communist families or whatever... Um, you know, I'll tell you a story. When I, you know, before I tell you the story, I'll make another, one more point. Then I'll tell you the story. Then we'll go on to gun control and Blackwater. Okay, so one last point on that and then the story and then we'll move on. So the last point, um, what was the last point? Now it's escaping me. What was the last point I was going to say? Oh, right. Um, here's the thing. People who didn't come from a communist family, people who didn't come from an activist background, people who didn't go to protest with their parents when they were a kid, people that didn't grow up on the left, who become communists, points to one of the problems with communist groups that I've noticed, is that almost all the young people I know that are into communism, they got into it on their own and they went and looked at the communist groups. They had to track down the communist groups. They had to track them down and that, sadly, the story of a lot of young communists in the United States is, you know, not even, you know, finding out on the internet there are communists, tracking them down, looking at the various groups and trying to be like, okay, which one sucks the least? Which one will actually, like, try to recruit me? And, you know, they don't, they don't join the communist movement because they see this big, huge revolutionary group called the Communist Party and it looks exciting, and they want to find out what it's about, and it's communist, and so they learn. It's not how it works. It's like they become interested in communism by learning about it in school or seeing, you know, reading history or, or whatever, and then they go and find the communist groups and settle for them. And when things really change in this country, when we're, when we're approaching a revolutionary situation, it'll be the opposite. 
it'll be there'll be amazing groups all over this country doing amazing work that are communist and people won't discover communism on their own and go looking for them communism will be everywhere it'll be in their neighborhood it'll be in their community and they'll be attracted to what communism is doing and on that basis they'll join it and that's the difference that's the difference nobody in china joined mao because they, they read in their school history book about communism and thought, oh, I wonder if there's a communist in China. Well, I know. And then they tracked it down. Yes, in the phone book, there's Communist Party of China. There's this guy, Mao, who's got this. That's not how it worked. That's how it works now because communists are almost irrelevant in the United States. But when there's a revolutionary situation, communists will be everywhere and people will join them on the basis of seeing them. Communists will come to them. They won't come to communism. Right now in the United States, people come to communists. They go looking for communists. They find them. When shit is for real, communists will come to you. And that's the difference. Um, and that's what needs to be changed, right? We need to get out of the movement and get to the masses. Um, and I hope that made sense. I was trying to put it clearly. So now the little anecdote, the little anecdote, um, and then we'll move on to the other super chats. So the little anecdote is, um, now what was the little anecdote? Everything's just falling out of my head tonight. Um, oh, you know, I became a communist in Ohio. Um, you know, I was I was interested in communism, and I went looking for communist groups. I found a certain Maoist group. I found the Workers' World Party, which I eventually joined. Um, and, you know, when I was joining the Workers' World Party, you know, this was way a long time ago. They're not like this at all anymore. They've had so many splits, and so much has changed since then. But they were still kind of, the PSL split had just happened. They were still kind of reeling from the split with, that formed the Party of Socialism and Liberation. And part of my joining was they sent me to New York for a week. And I remember I went to New York for a week. Um, and the New York branch of the Workers' World Party was one of the strongest branches. And there were a lot of red diaper children, you know, people whose parents had been in the party that were active in the New York City party. And that was when I first started thinking that there was something, you know, that, that kids that, are, that are grew up in the party don't understand it. I was in New York for a week, you know, it was like I was on school break or something and I was handing out, I, I was with them in New York and so it was like, you know, they need you to go to New York and help out the party for a week. And I slept on somebody's couch and I was in New York for a week and there were a lot of people around the party at that point whose parents had been in the party. And I remember that like, I was perplexed because we were in a group that supported North Korea we were in a group that, you know, that, that had like tanky politics, but these young people that I was around whose parents were all leaders of the group, you know, didn't, didn't know anything about that. And I was just like, how can you not, why are you in the workers world party and you don't know anything about North Korea? Like, like if you're in a group that supports North Korea, you better know about it. Cause that's like most Americans think North Korea is like pure evil. And it was weird. And their response, you know, and then. You know, the group organized little protests all the time. And so a lot of what I did that week was go around with this crew of the youth, which was like children of people that were in the party, and go to other socialist groups events and hand out leaflets to try to get them to come to the rallies. And I remember people would take those leaflets and crumple them and throw them in the garbage and say, you support North Korea, you tanky. I mean, not tanky, that wasn't the word back then. You, you're a Stalinist or... And I would try to argue with these people and they would say, shh, don't talk about that stuff. It scares people away. And I was just like, what? And I was perplexed because it was like, on the one hand, we were, I mean, we handed out a leaflet that said, come to our rally to protest the war in Iraq. And it just said it didn't have anything about North Korea on it. But they would see that and go, you, North, they knew immediately that we were the Workers' World Party. But, there was this feeling that, that all the controversial positions the party should have, we should never argue with people about. And it was weird. Um, and then when I would talk to these other younger people whose parents were all leaders of the group, they didn't know anything about North Korea, anything about Venezuela, anything about Iran. They didn't know about it. And they didn't care. It was weird. And it was just, there was this, the way we do things as a group is... We have protests around whatever the latest trendy liberal cause is, and we have hardline tanky positions, and liberals hate us for those positions, but we never talk about those positions. We pretend they don't exist and assume that all the liberals have come to our rallies. It was very, it was like this weird double think. It was a weird, weird double think, and that's Marxism in decay. 
in the 80s, you could do that. In the 80s, you know, people would disagree with your positions, but if you set up the stage and all of that, there was enough of a movement back then, people would come. There was this weird spot that the left was in, um, you know, where the Workers' World Party, it was like, we're going to have these hardline tanky positions, not even be able to defend them in arguments, never really explain them to other people, just kind of pretend we're regular liberals. And when people bait us, everyone knew, I mean, I would hand them and say, it would say troops out now coalition and be like, yeah, workers world. Yeah, we know what you are. And, be, and, 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 then, and then what perplexed me the most is even the other young people whose parents were big workers world people didn't understand the positions and didn't want to. And it was like, this was just, the, it was like their church, right? Um, you know, it was just, well, my mom and dad are in this group ever since I've been a kid. I've been going to the rallies and handing out the leaflets. You know, it was like their church. I mean, they just, you know, this is what we do. We go around to other socialist groups and hand out leaflets to come to our rallies. We have rallies, and this is what we do. And almost all of those people quit within a few years. They kind of, they, you know, it was just, this is what we do. I mean, this is what my parents raised me to do, but they would go to college, make new friends, get a new job, and stop doing that. Um, you know, and it was just kind of, it was weird. Um, you know, and that, that that kind of machine culture, right? Um, I guess that's just me thinking off the top of my head about my experience with red diaper children, was these red diaper children, first of all, they all stopped doing it by the time they moved out of their parents' house. They weren't doing it anymore. Like, their parents were almost kind of making them do it, probably, you know, on some level. Um, or at least their, their social circle. You know, it was like their church. It was actually a lot like their church, the more I think about it. The more I think about it, you know, I grew up in the United Church of Christ and, you know, I mean, there was a time when I was a teen where I started being kind of an atheist. You know, I'm, I'm more of a religious person now, but, you know, like, my church was my church. I went to church every Sunday, even when I was a teenage atheist. I still went to church every Sunday. And, like, you know, for a lot of these people, it was just their parents' church, uh, the Workers' World Party. And so they grew up and, you know, stopped going to church on Sunday, which, I mean, like, I grew up, I stopped going to church with my parents. And, and that was kind of what happened. So I guess this all just fits into my point about, you know, sometimes red diaper children don't understand how important it is. Though there's exceptions to that rule. There's some red diaper children that are amazing. Thank you, Brent McKinney, for the super chat. Much appreciated. There are some red diaper children who do amazing revolutionary work. So I'm generalizing here. I'm just speaking from my own experience. Okay. Enough about that. Gun control. Well, you know, in the Soviet Union, um, you know, in, in rural villages, people were able to buy uh, weapons all the time. You know, um, you know, I mean, I mean, yeah, it's kind of cliche. There's that bumper sticker we've all seen from the NRA. It's like big, famous gun control advocates, Stalin, Hitler, Fidel. But like, you know, in the Soviet Union, you know, yeah, if you were an anti-communist, if you were considered to be an enemy of the state or something like that, you weren't going to get a gun. But a lot of people in rural villages had hunting rifles. Um, you know, the population, you know, you weren't in the cities, people weren't armed. But in rural areas, people were armed. A lot of uh, party members, party leaders were all armed in their homes, usually. There was a lot of guns in the Soviet Union. Same for China, right? Yeah, technically, yeah, if you were an enemy of the state, you were considered an anti-communist, you weren't going to have a gun. But party members had guns, uh, rural people had hunting rifles, there were all kinds of guns. And in fact, military weapons manufacturing was a big part of the Soviet economy, was a big part of the Chinese economy. North Korea, they make some of the best weapons in the world, from what I understand. I mean, they're sending weapons everywhere, AK-47s, right? You know, and that, that, that yeah, I mean, they, they did have it so they could, you know, gun, gun ownership was not considered, this 60-year-old is sick of anti-boomer talk. Oh, I'm sorry, John. Um, you know... I mean, yeah, I, um, you know, um, but yeah, I, I mean, my understanding is that, um, that, um, I'll write it down, John, by the way, I'll give you an answer to that. You know, that, that people had guns, people had weapons, right? There wasn't, they didn't consider it to be a constitutional right, right? I think it was pretty much if you were declared anti-party or anti-Soviet, you didn't get a gun. End of story. There was no, like, Supreme Court that said, oh, it's your right to bear arms, Second Amendment. There's none of that. But a lot of socialist countries, there was widespread gun ownership. Um, you know, there was, and people's militias, community militias, and stuff like that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's just not, not accurate. Um, not accurate. Um, you know, that... You know, and this narrative that communists take our guns away. Venezuela actually has a big problem with private gun ownership. Big problem with private gun ownership. There's a lot of private gun ownership in Venezuela. You know, my friend Dakota Lilly, he went on Fox News and Tucker Carlson said, well, the guns are all owned by the government in Venezuela. False. Private gun ownership is widespread in Venezuela and a lot of Latin, a lot of Latin American countries. Um, there's a lot of gun violence in Venezuela, gun crime. So... 
yeah, you know, um, gun control in socialist countries, it's complicated. It's not that simple, right? Um, you know. Basically, my understanding, in most socialist countries, if you're considered to be anti-communist or anti-government, your gun are, is taken away. However, among people that are not considered anti-communist, guns are, are usually available. That's generally how it is. Okay. Um, I'm not saying that's right. I'm just telling you how it is. Uh, Blackwater in China. You know, Blackwater has also done deals in Venezuela, too, from what I understand. I understand that, that Eric Prince of Blackwater went to, went to Venezuela. Someone said, under no pretext. I don't know what that means. What does under no pretext mean? Someone, someone tell me what that means. Uh, under no pretext. I'm oh, writing it down. Um, you know, gun ownership, private gun ownership in, in Venezuela. Or, I'm sorry, Blackwater in China. They went to Venezuela. Um, they made some kind of deal or something. Um, but yeah, I mean, different governments make different contracts for different reasons. I mean, if China thinks it's in its interest to have private security firms... You know, I mean, I, I can't tell you why that's happening. I'm not in on the conversations, um, but, you know, I mean, is it happening? I believe it's probably happening. Private security companies, that's how they operate. So that's all there is to that. John Edwards says he's tired of anti-boomer talk. I'm sorry to hear that, John. You know, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not, I, I would never go against anyone because of their age, right? Um, you know, you know, and I mean, hey, you know, baby boomer generations have been through a lot. Um, so, um, someone said, under no pretext should the working class be disarmed. Okay, well, that's, yeah, I mean, it's widely understood that, that you know, gun control in this country was very racist. Uh, it was about disarming black people, and historically in the United States. Um, so, you know, I mean, and, and, you know, let's remember, you know, the Black Panthers and Angela Davis. That was one of their big things, was the right to bear arms. Very different than the NRA of today. So, all right, folks. Anything else before I go, before I say goodbye? Anything else? Any Anything else? Any other super chats? Any other questions people would like me to answer? Anything else? Anything else, folks, before we wrap this up? Alrighty. Well, if there's nothing further, I'll just say this. We need a government of action to fight for working families. We need a government of action to fight for working families. We need a government of action to fight for working families. We need a government of action to fight for working families. Ever since... Let me start again. A new upsurge in the struggle against U.S. imperialism is now emerging throughout the world. Ever since World War II, U.S. imperialism and its followers have been continuously launching wars of aggression. But the people of various countries have been continuously waging revolutionary wars to defeat their aggression. While the danger of a new world war still exists and the people of all countries must get prepared, revolution is the main trend in the world today. While the danger of a new world war still exists, and the people of all countries must get prepared. Revolution is the main trend in the world today. On that note, folks, I'm out.